and facial aesthetics case files, international stars. And welcome each one of you to this wonderful webinar on oculoplasty and facial aesthetics. And believe me, we have the best of the best, not only from oculoplasty and facial aesthetics, but also from Indian ophthalmology and the world over. Let me introduce to you our AIOS president, Pal Sasdev. He is also the chairman of the Scientific Committee IRSI, chairman and managing director, Center for Sight Group of Eye Hospitals. I have great pleasure introducing Professor Namrata Sharma, who is the secretary of AIOS and professor of ophthalmology, cataract, cornea, and refractive services, RP Center. All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And now our wonderful team scientific committee of All India Ophthalmological Society, Dr. Amit Porwal, member scientific committee from the central zone, Dr. J.S. Balla, member scientific committee from the north zone, Dr. K.P. Kudlu, member scientific committee from the south zone, Dr. Parikshit Gokte, member scientific committee from the west zone, Dr. Sonu Goel, member scientific committee from the West Zone and Somshila Murthy, uh, Member Scientific Committee. And we have Dr. Fairuz, who is the lead in this scientific committee and who is going to be the moderator for this program today. So over to you, Dr. Fairuz, and welcome to the webinar. Yes, Dr. Farooz. May I invite Dr. Namrata to give a welcome note? Thank you, Farooz. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome everybody on this uh, webinar, which is on oculoplasty and facial aesthetics case files. And it is a global web webinar uh, 2020, and truly global, because we have international guests from all over the world in this era of COVID, where we can only uh, you know, be connected virtually rather than uh, physically. So I would like to welcome Dr. Almadine from Lebanon, Dr. Uh, uh, Barmadin from Italy, Dr. Barkit and Dr. Kekawa from USA, Dr. Hansen from Philippines, and Dr. Liu from China. It is my pleasure to welcome our own very, uh, uh, to welcome great national faculty that we have. And I take this uh, opportunity to welcome Dr. A.K. Gupta sir, Dr. Usha Kim, Dr. Lakshmi Mahesh, Dr. Abjit Kaur, uh, Santosh, Milind, Ad Adit, Sajad, Mukesh, Javed, it's a, it's a whole galaxy of uh, oculoplasty fraternity that we have today. Apart from this, the lovely ladies who are there today from the, uh, uh, from the field of oculoplasty and that to aesthetics, and I'm sure Peruz has been a little partial because the list is long. So Dr. Kasturi, Anita, my very good friend, Savri, Ankita, Preeti, Sabrina, Shubra, Roshmi, and uh, Joyata as well as Shefali, and our uh, very uh, own uh, scientific committee members who are there with us, uh, Parikshit Gokute and Amit Porwal. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. I'm sure it's going to be a great scientific feast. Thank you very much, ma'am. May I next invite Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, our beloved president of All India Ophthalmological Society, to kindly inaugurate the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Feroz, uh, Partha from the Scientific Committee and other members of the Scientific Committee for arranging this program. And uh, as the name goes, aesthetics uh, and uh, oculoplasty, facial oculoplasty, I think it's all about looking good, looking beautiful, looking fresh, you're looking young. And I think uh, all the guys and the girls i would say the ladies they all they all uh, look they all defy age and uh, maybe they are also great uh, surgeons or whatever they do on their own selves but i think they are really ageless starting with uh, dr grover and dr santosh and uh, dr Husley, i would say and uh, obviously uh, amongst the uh, women i would say kasturi is uh, ageless i suppose uh, you see her picture with her daughter it's difficult to make out who the mother and who the daughter is 
and uh, maybe anita dr bolkar everybody and sabrina after seeing you after long time uh, so i think uh, shubhra i don't know i i am not uh, there are too many people and maybe uh, if i miss somebody's name that's fine but i think it's a very very important uh, subject that we have uh uh that obviously is gaining more and more traction nowadays like uh, there are uh, the ophthalmology we have the uh, refractive surgery which has gained traction and uh, hair aesthetics and oculoplasty is also something that is gaining traction and i think this is one subject that is uh, still not permeated down to the medical college level etc as to what exactly are the new things that are happening uh in this particular field and i think it's a great service uh, that we'll be doing to our fellow ophthalmologists to actually bring them up to date to this particular uh, field or sub super speciality i would say of ophthalmology so all the very best because the stalwarts are fantastic uh i have heard about them and uh, they do fantastic work and let's uh, start the session feroz uh, and all the very best uh, welcome everyone to this session thank you thank you very much sir so we uh, immediately go to our session and uh, we have a first speaker dr ramzi i invite dr somshila uh, murthy are uh, one of the smartest uh, scientific committee member from lv prasad uh, she is a cornea specialist and uh, she's going to do the introduction for ramzi dr somshila good evening everyone thank you very much feroz for the introduction it's uh, definitely a real pleasure to be introducing someone so young and charming that's dr ramzi alamadeen he's from the american university of beirut from lebanon and he heads the division of orbit oculoplasty and oculofacial and plastic surgery and he's also done his esopris fellowship from uc san diego as well as being an assistant professor in clinical ophthalmology and the medical director for the ophthalmology specialty clinics at his center so i give you dr ramzi alamedin thank you dr somshila thank you ramzi you can go ahead scare introduction uh, and thank you for the scientific committee and dr fairu for having me can you hear me yes your slide mm -hmm. share Is this good? Yes, perfect. Perfect. So thank you for having me. Um I'll be talking in these brief 4 minutes about the treacherous uh, anterior lamella in lower lid blepharoplasty. And I think that uh Taylor Swift got it right when she sang that not is worth the drive. And we know very well that blepharoplasty can have some complications. Uh the most uh, uh uh feared one is probably lower lid retraction and cantal uh, dystopia. So I will be presenting a couple of quick cases uh, in the hope to illustrate some of the thought process that we go through to try to prevent having su uh, such a complication. Um in this first case this is a lady that presented to me after having surgery done elsewhere but I was lucky enough to get her pre-op photo and you can tell that she had uh, both upper and lower lid dermatocalases and fat prolapse as well as ptosis and frontalis overaction. and you can see that there's a little bit of pre-existing retraction she had an upper and lower lid blepharoplasty as well as a ptosis repair but you can see that she's not particularly very happy uh, because although her ptosis is better and the fat prolapse is much better but you can see that there is worsening of the lower lid retraction and there is lateral cantal dystopia so you we go back to the drawing board what must have happened for this lower lid retraction to happen and i would like to think of retraction as a very anatomical problem uh it's either a shortened anterior lamella where we have removed too much skin or orbicularis or if there's middle lamellar scarring where there is uh, too much scarring at the level of the septum or devolumization at the level of the orbital fat as well as horizontal laxity which is usually this 3d structure which is the medial and the lateral cantal tendons as well as the orbicularis stones that are not addressed in surgery So whenever a surgeon wants to do a blepharoplasty there's usually a very methodical process to follow. First of all we assess the patients in clinic and then we make a design or a drawing of what we need to do and then finally we execute. So in this assessment phase and this is something we all know but we have to go through thoroughly is that we should always check for the predisposing factors. 
whether it is the senile ectropion with the snapback test uh, or the floppy eyelid syndrome with the excessive laxity or the facial palsy or multiple surgeries that lead to facial palsy and the question of negative vector with the mid-face recession with respect to a proptotic flow. And finally, the question of mid-face descent. And so when the second case came in, it really wants to take us through these factors in a detailed way. Uh, this is a patient that had surgery by a renowned senior plastic surgery, uh, surgeon in town. And you can see that he has severe lower lid retraction and ectropion. And trying to see what he has, you can see that there is definitely a shortened anterior lamella. There is devolumization of the middle lamella, as well as horizontal uh, laxity. And looking at his predisposing factors, he had senile ectropion. He also had some element of floppy eyelid, as well as a bit of a negative vector and mid-face descent. So it makes me wonder, what must have happened with this senior surgeon who's done hundreds of thousands of surgeries to get this mistake? And don't get me wrong. I mean, I've had my fair shares of complications. We are all humans. We all make uh, mistakes and complications happen. They happen, but what must have gone wrong? What is that key factor that this surgeon must have missed for this to happen. And I think it really hit me in the same way that uh, an apple hit Newton's head, not to compare myself to Newton, but it really hit me when that patient went on that surgical table and laid down from the upright to the supine position, because around 80 to 90% of his retraction suddenly got better just by laying down on that table. And this illustrates very much the role of gravity with respect to the anterior lamella. And this has been studied by Rod Rorick that looked into the uh, fat pads and all the inner connections between. We also have studies that look into the changes that happen in the face from the uh, supine to the upright position. You can see the movement in the SOOF fat pads and the lengthening of the lid cheek junction and all the movements of the landmarks of the face, which is because of the changes that happen to the uh, bony uh, landmarks. So I've tried to look into every patient I do. This is a patient I've seen last week, and you can see the significant changes in the position of the uh, mid-face and the significant lengthening of the eyelid and the lid-cheek junction just from going to the supine to the upright position. We all have these goals whenever we're designing and making surgeries. One of the most important ones, tackle mid-face descent. We're still doing this, but I'm always reminding myself and these cases remind me even further that whenever we want to measure how much skin to excise, if the patient is laying down on the table and during surgery, it's already too late. We should do this not during surgery, but before surgery, even if it's in the pre-op holding area, because you uh, avoid some mistakes. And the last tip and trick is that whenever you're doing a transcutaneous approach, you should always have a soof lift or even an orbic pexy. And you should also consider alternatives to skin excision, such as CO2 lasers, chemical peels or radio frequency or others. Uh, thank you. I hope I, I went thank less than four minutes. It's fine, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ramzi. So now uh, it's over to you, Dr. Kasturi and uh, Dr. Anita uh, for the discussion of the same. A very um, nice yeah. presentation. Dr. Ramsey, and I do agree with you that today lower lid vecroplasty is the most commonly performed ochloplasty surgery. But what I like in a presentation that you really mentioned that we need to prevent, the most important that we should be able to forecast the complications, for which a very important factor is that we should do a preoperative assessment. So you have nicely mentioned about the three lamellae, the anterior, the mid, and the um, the anterior lamellae mid and the posterior. So if you have mentioned that there's scarring, which can be led, uh, which must have led to this retraction. But what I believe is that if there is too much of scarring of the posterior lamellae, we get basically an entropion. If there is too much of scarring of the middle lamellae, we get the retraction. And too much of scarring of the anterior lamellae, we get the ectropion. So what you have mentioned, this is very perfect because if you look to the middle lamellae, like if we looked at the tarsus, which lies in the most cranial part of the upper lid, and then in the tarsus, we have this structure, a three-dimensional structure, which is the lower lid retractus. So this capsular palpable fascia, which is attached to the caudal part with tarsus, then forms a Lockwood ligament, and it flows the globe and ends up into the inferior fascia. And this orbital septum, which is a very important part of the middle lamellae, it comes from the 
arcus marginalis and hits here so this triangular structure is very important and any scarring in this middle lamina can lead to retraction in between we have the fat and too much of fat removal and the negative vector i think i could very well appreciate the first patient which was having a negative vector yes negative vector also can predispose to some amount of the retraction so very nice presentation but i just wanted to highlight one more thing that which you have mentioned the marking the assessment the supine and the upright position and the most important way of assessing especially when we do an external approach is to ask the patient to look up open the mouth and then only we do a skin assessment uh hello can you hear me yes dr anita yeah yeah yes dr ranvi that was really a very nice and very uh, you put everything together very nicely and i would also like to reiterate that uh, most of the surgery must be done before you even reach the table So your assessment in the sitting position is so important, both uh, and the laxity. Especially the older the patient, you really have to look out for the laxity. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you. So, I mean, how do you when you? I mean, you've talked about the prevention. How do you tackle these cases? Is there anything that can be done in the early post-op if it is a mild? Is there any? Um, do you you know believe in giving any injection? Um, you know, steroid injection to stop scarring. Is there any role of that? Yes, definitely. I I actually talk to my patients and tell them that there's two phases of treatment. I call the first one the biological phase, and then the second one the mechanical phase. And in the biological phase, I really try to fight these factors that are biologic that are causing the fibrosis and retraction. So we inject a lot of five uh, FU and some of the uh, hyaluronic acid in devolumized eyelids, and this has been uh, shown in some of the studies by Goldberg and and other people. And I think it does work. I've seen wonderful results with just injecting. some fillers and uh sometimes five fu uh, i'm a bit careful with steroids because you know in this part of the world there uh people are a bit pigmented and you can get hypopigmentations uh, but this is something that also obviously works and once that phase is over if there's still some uh, retraction or ectropion then they need to have surgery yeah i think yeah i'm saying i have a question if the patient has got a big pain how do you manage I'm sorry, I missed that question. Comes with a mixed stosis. How do you manage mixed phase stosis, Ramsey? Yeah, so I mean, if the patient has pre-existing mid phase stosis, you have to address this with the souffle, and you have to make sure that you know you're not removing that mid phase and you're not reattaching it properly. Uh, having a very weak souffle with a weak suture, we can't expect that to hold for much longer. So you need to tackle that in a more permanent uh, approach to try to avoid this early retraction. All right. So, if there is one message that we want to, like you know, uh, put across uh, the viewers and all the panelists, what would it be, Ramzi, regarding uh, blepharoplasty? I think. I mean, I only had four minutes, so it's a really big topic. I could speak for hours about this, but I think the most important part is to always be methodical. to always look for every single detail and then to make sure you have your plan ready before surgery this is not something uh to discover along the way this is something that has to be planned before and you're just executing it during surgery obviously there's uh, there's exceptions for every rule but in general you know this is the pattern that i personally like to follow all right thank you very much uh, so can we go to the next uh, presentation for today So, uh, Adit. Yeah, is my screen is my screen visible? Uh, Adit, it is visible, but okay. can you stop? Uh, yeah, share. Yeah, I, I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. So we yeah. need to introduce you. <laughs> oh yes. Okay. Um, right. um, so may I request Dr. Parikshit? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank introduce. you. Yeah, Dr. Adit. Uh, yeah, Dr. Adit is from the same city as me, and as I can see in the entire panel, I think oculoplasty is full of very handsome people. Oh, okay. so we have one another dynamic oculoplasty surgeon, and Dr. Adit is the managing director of Mumbai Eye Plastic uh, Surgery. He's an alumnus of PGI and LV Prasad and Stein Eye Institute, Los Angeles. Ah, uh, but you, what are you doing? Yes, hello. Someone has to uh, mute. Yeah, Parikshit. Hey, uh, 
So thank you, Dr. Parikshit, for that uh, generous introduction. I also thank Team AIOS for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Ramzi and uh, Dr. Kasturi has already discussed a little bit about uh, my case, which I'm going to talk about. So this young lady uh, visited us with basically a blepharoplasty, which was done by a plastic surgeon, uh, utilizing the transconjunctival approach. And she noticed an abnormality in her eyelid after the first blepharoplasty itself. She went back to her primary surgeon who again did a revision procedure. And you can see that the correction was not achieved according to her expectations. When she came to me, she came with a lower eyelid psychiatricial entropion, which was causing the eyelashes to rub on the globe and the cornea, thus causing corneal epitheliopathy, lower eyelid tight tightening and retraction. She also complained of diplopia in extreme gazes, and there was an inferior focal symblepharon on the lower in the lower fornix, which was also causing shallowing of the fornix. By natural instinct, she was three months post-op from the primary surgery. I injected two sessions of five fluorouracil injections in the scar tissue, hoping that it would soften up and improve the entropia, giving me scope for correction in future surgeries. The tether can be seen in this area of blue shadow. This was the area of maximum tether. But even after two sessions of five fluorouracil injections, she did not improve much. And her corneal epitheliopathy was increasing. Now, we all know that uh, lower eyelid retraction with ectropion is very common after blepharoplasty using the transcutaneous rule. And this can be managed with fillers in certain cases by stretching the skin and causing biomodulation. I had the same instinct for this case, but the patient was physically, mentally, and financially exhausted and was look looking for definitive results. So I went back and thought about the pathophysiology of this disease. We all know that the eyelid comprises of basically two lamellae and an additional middle lamella, which comprises of the septum and the orbital fat. In this case, the primary pathophysiology was along with middle lamellar shortening. There was shortening of the conjunctiva as well with associated volume collapse as was seen in the picture. So we would have to do something to correct the volume defect as well as improve the conjunctival status so that she doesn't develop a posterior contraction again and the entropion is correct corrected. I went back into literature and since olden days, there have been a lot of spacer grafts which have been used to correct such defects ranging from heart palate, auricular cartilage and mucous membrane grafts. But the paper that caught my eye was by the Don Kikawa group, where they have used a DFG uh, in cases of lower eyelid retraction. But mind you, it was for ectropion and retraction, which was present in such patients. So I went ahead and thought that maybe a fat strip graft would work well for such a patient. And I will allow the conjunctiva to grow over that fat strip. So these are some intraoperative photos. I proceeded ahead with a canthotomy and cantholysis because I needed some space for dissection. I obviously had to correct the posterior lamella. So an end glove lysis would have no role in such a case. So you can see that the psychiatric release was performed and the area of maximum tether was very close to the infraorbital foramen and the orbital ligament. So release of the orbit orbicularis retaining ligament was done. Focal a dissection of the conjunctival simlepharon was done and because of the fat transfer which the primary plastic surgeon had done to regain volume, there was some amount of fibrosis and fat consolidation near the inferior oblique, which was again removed. A fat strip was uh, harvested from the retroauricular uh, area, and the strip was placed uh, in the defect around the fornix and was sutured with 7O Vicryl continuous sut running sutures. Now, to my luck, this uh, lady visited me two weeks ago, and this is how she looks now. Her entropion is well corrected with a sharp lateral canthus. Volume defect has filled up a little bit, but still there is a little bit of volume loss in the tear trough area, which will need further correction. So to conclude, I think 
while managing such cases you need to respect the anatomical principles carry meticulous surgical dissection and think about the basics this is the pre and post operative picture one month post operative you can see that the entropion is well corrected and the volume also has been taken care of to a certain extent thank you thank you thank you dr adit uh, wonderful presentation uh, may i invite dr uh, milan naik and dr preeti uday uh, to discuss this case dr milan can you take over so uh, so uh, adit wonderful case and great results indeed one question for you was the conjunctival epithelium left raw onto the fat or did you have to cover it so i did not cover the conjunctival epithelium was short although okay. it was covering the tarsus and it was present a strip of conjunctival epithelium was present in the fornix but i assume that it is going to grow the conjunctiva is like a mother so it grows everywhere it provides protection to the whole ocular surface so the conjunctiva grew up really well the defect was covered within and plus i had placed the eyelid on frost for a week to keep it on stretch so it sort of epithelized and then lent epithelial yes wonderful great results preeti what do you have to say uh, well, i think it was managed here we have a deficit of the middle of the channel please please you're not audible preeti your voice is breaking now i I think there are some other surrounding ones. I am. There's an echo. There's an echo coming to your mic. I don't. Hello. Do we? Yeah. Do we have Dr. Cat? Cat. Uh, Dr. Cat. What do you think about this case? Hi. Um. Well, I think it's a, a great case, and um, I think these are difficult cases when you get these recurrent cicatrix and retraction. As we all know, we can do excellent surgery and keep going back in, and and they actually keep coming back. And I do think dermis fat or some sort of fat strip is fantastic for this. I've used it before, and um, often you can tell that it's actually bound. The cheek and lid is bound to the bone, and you really need to release and then make sure it kind of covers that area too, so it doesn't bind back to the orbital rim. Um, I, I am curious to see what it'll be like um, a little more um, time from now because one month is still early. Um, but I do think it's a great result so far and I do like that technique. So great job. Thank you. Dr. Preeti, are you in with the audio? Yeah, yes. Are you okay now? Yeah. What I was sure is that we needed to replace the middle case. And um, it's quite a good option. Uh, what I would is also population so maybe i would five if you even three weeks post operative starting in patient and another thing is i would usually anchor it in two places because maybe i would anchor it on the medial and the lateral corners so that it doesn't roll over even after the operative task when we release it it does roll over Um, another thing is it's, it's vascularity. Like you have used more fat, so the fat gets vascularity from the dermis. So I was thinking the vascularity will also come from the conjunctiva. But since you have left that area without covering the conjunctiva, I would take the dermis so that that gets the vascularity and you will have less fat loss. In the but uh, also, cataplasty yeah, would help in this case. a very small closed canthoplasty would keep the lid in a uh, taut position and prevent a recurrence in future okay yes uh, canthoplasty was done in the end okay okay so it's it's perfectly managed i think dr milan do you would you want to yeah yeah uh, just with regards to the probable cause i think uh, many surgeons tend to suture the conjunctival wound and i'm yes That that could be one of the reasons. It's most of us, like most of the oculoplastic surgeons, probably would leave it alone to epithelize. But I, plastic I, surgeons I, do suture them. Yeah, 
I also think that excessive because the general plastic surgeons tend to use cautery at higher settings. So maybe because of excessive cautery use, also it could be something which has caused the conjunctival damage, leading to entropion and psychiatry. Yeah, and another point is that the psychiatrics is usually stuck to the orbital rim, as Dr. Cat was pointing out. So sometimes I put small fat pearls along the inferior orbital rim yeah. to prevent the, uh, uh, the lit tissues from sticking back to that area in the post-op period. Perfect. Dr. Millen, would you just want to give us a message, one message from this particular case of an entropion post blepharoplasty? Well, in the first three months of the post-operative period, it's as uh, Ramsey said, that is a biological phase where you could try out steroids or 5-FU, even stretching, upward stretching of the eyelid would help. Immediate post-operatively, a traction suture is going to avoid this problem, not suturing the conjunctiva when you are doing the blepharoplasty. And once you're past beyond the biological phase, then you'll have to look for spacers, lengthening the middle lamella or the posterior lamella or both. Okay. Perfect. So we have Dr. Santosh. Uh, Dr. Santosh, do we have any questions from the viewers? Not for this particular case, but for the previous case, there were a couple of questions. How do you repair the middle lamella and when do you plan to do it? Ramzi? Let me unmute myself. So, I mean, the middle lamella is really a question of debate, I think. I mean, this is my understanding that people are still talking about what exactly is the middle lamella. So I personally would like to consider it the septum as well as the orbital fat. It's like this whole area of volume. There is definitely a question of volume. There's a question of scarring. And this is why we just, uh, uh, in the case uh, that we just showed by Adit, it shows that uh, whenever you put volume back, there's a stretching of that uh, middle lamella. So in my mind, again, whenever you revolumize that eyelid, you have to look at the etiology, if it's mostly posterior or anterior lamella. That's the beauty of the uh, dermis fat graft, is that whenever you have a posterior lamellar uh, shortening, as well as devolumization, then you are getting, uh, you're hitting two birds with a stone. Um, but it can be a bit different whenever you need more uh, sturdy uh, stretches. This is what uh, Kat alluded to. A lot of times we get disappointed and it re-retracts again. Uh, this is when you need to go back and think of uh, more sturdy posterior lamellar spacers, maybe cartilage grafts or whatever are other uh, um, grafts that you're comfortable harvesting, actually. There's a question from Dr. Hawate to all the panelists. Do you do, always do mid-phase or mini mid-phase lift with lower lid blepharoplast? I, I, I like to do midi, um, a mid-phase lift only if I have the deep zygomatico facial ligament uh, being exposed. So if you have a long lower eyelid where the orbitomalar ligament is uh, too lax in severe cases, in those cases, mid-face lift really helps. Dr. Millen? Well, I don't personally add a mid-face lift. Instead, I add volume to it. Dr. Kasturi? Kasturi, you're... Unmute yourself. Audio, uh, audio. I usually add with a soup lift or sometimes with a smash or orbicular lift. All right. Ramzi and Adit, do you have anything to add? I, th I, th I think if there's no, uh, there's no mid-phase ptosis, there's no really need to lift the whole soup. You can probably just go away with, a, with an orbic pexy if you're doing transcutaneous. Perfect. And I want to add that depending upon the grade of retraction, the management should be... I mean, taken care of. Like, if it is very mild, it was very good with massage or even with a hyaluronic acid filler. But only in moderate cases of retraction, like retraction mode between two to five, those are the cases which I prefer this end glove license, which has been shown very nicely by Adit. And in a very severe, like more than five millimeter retraction, those are the cases which I prefer to have the spacer graft. All right. Any other question, Dr. Munawar? Yeah. There's one more question. Uh, how and uh, how do you inject 5FU and in what dose and when exactly do you inject? Dr. Millen? Adit, you have injected 5FU in this case, right? Yes. So 5FU usually should be injected in the first uh, couple of months. I personally don't inject it beyond three months. This case presented to me within the first three months. So I tried it out and plus 
I couldn't operate it because the whole nation was under lockdown. So I wanted to delay the surgery as well and buy time to think about the management for this case. I usually inject it directly into the cicatrix. It's very difficult to inject in a tough scar, 5 FU. So I take a 1 cc tuberculin syringe and I uh, attach a 26 gauge needle. So I have seen that a 30 gauge needle gives more resistance in a scar tissue. So I take a 26 gauge needle, apply Prilox for around an hour before the injection. And I just give in a unit, a 0.1 ml boluses at two points around the scar area and massage it gently. That's it. And 5FU is very uh, cheaply available. It's It hardly costs 10 to 16 rupees per vial. All right. Another monkey. Thank you. Can we go to the next? That's it. No more questions. Thank you. So we are going to the next speaker today. Uh, uh, Dr. Francisco, can yes. you please? Yeah, I, I have an introduction for you. Ah, yeah, sorry. It is unshared. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So, may I invite Dr. Amit to kindly introduce uh, Dr. Francisco? Dr. Amit? Thank you for and Dr. Yeah. Amit, am I audible for you? No, now you are. Please. Yeah. So thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Francisco Bernandini. He's an octoplastica Bernandini. He is practicing in Genova, Roma, Milano, Torino, and Napoli in Italy. He's a teaching professor in University of Genova and in Professor in the University of Iowa, literal board member of Octavic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Dr. Francisco. Uh, Dr. Francisco, welcome, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Please go ahead and share your slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. I feel uh, uh, I feel like being <clears throat> among friends, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I wanna I wanna present you uh, an interesting uh, complication, interesting case that I uh, uh, I have managed uh, uh, through the years. And uh, the first uh, thing that I wanna bring uh, to your attention is. Uh, uh, what do these two patients have in common? I'm sure that Sabrina and Shubra both will recognize the complication, what, what we'll be about. But they, because uh, if you can't answer to this question, you will know what's going on with the patient that's about to present. So let's, uh, let's get into the patient concerns. There's a 60 year uh, old female, uh, occasional drinker, uh, not a smoker. She's been referred to me from Argentina. Uh, with a history of progressive uh, ptosis and swelling during the last four years. So she has uh, had uh, facelift in, uh, uh, in 2015 in New York. She travels the world. She is a very prominent person in Italy, but uh, she lives in South America. So uh, she has consulted with everybody before seeing me uh, all across the world. And a few doctors uh, uh, suggested could that happen after... Uh, the facelifting because of blockage of lymphatic. Uh, other, uh, she had a history of uh, uh, injection with silicone, uh, and she had also other treatment with fillers, Botox. She had it all, but she doesn't tell exactly what was it. Other interesting stuff is uh, there are three things here in her past medical history that end up ends with the uh, itis. So vasculitis, colitis, sinusitis. Does this have anything to do with the immune system? And see, this is the patient as, uh, as I saw her uh, in my office in Milan. She comes in with a tosis, uh, significant tosis, uh, with a 0.5 or 1 uh, MRD1 or uh, on the right, 1.5, maybe 2 on the left. She has symmetrical high crease, no bra uh, brow overaction. Uh, a good function, not extraordinarily good, but better than 10. She has some uh, upper lip scars indicating a bluff, 
she didn't mention it specifically. And she has this uh, pretarsal edema. Or this picture without flash is uh, better. She, uh, she has really heavy lids on, on both sides and toes. And then she uses them well, but she feels really blocked, the visual field and such. So uh, she doesn't have a funny appearance to this area. So it's really hard to, to know what, uh, what happened. But she's been free of treatment for the last year. So she has not had uh, anything injected into her face for the last year. But nonetheless, if you look at this patient and the history of injection, you notice that she has something funny to their, uh, in this region. So you would notice that the glabella is funny looking as well as much as the lid. So it's, uh, it's larger than normal. It, there are no glabellar lines. And if you look at on the, from the side, she's missing, she's lacking concavity the physiological concavity, she, is look, she looks like a, an avatar uh, or something of, of the sort. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, edema of the upper lid resembles uh, the, this one of another patient in the lower lid. So it's a bluish edema. So what is this? Can it be what I think it was? So uh, delayed edema, HA related, uh, it surely, this to bring out uh, how the, 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 the glabella is, is uh, kind of deformed and, and um, in that part. So yes, that, that is what it is about. Uh, few scat scatter isolated case reports across the literature we, uh, we brought together with, uh, with my friend, Maurice Arstein and his team from Israel. We combine our series and we publish it just uh, uh, recently on uh, the Aesthetic Surgery Journal, late onset upper edema and brow edema is a, a long-term complication of hyaluronic acid filler. And it's, it's really, uh, so that as simple as that, once you see it, uh, you can treat it, but you, you figure out that uh, all the surgeons she has consulted, even the best, even the oculoplastic surgeon uh, suggested she had surgery. So this uh, few injection, that I gave her of hyaluronic is right straight in, in, uh, in the eyelid. This is not specifically that patient, this is a different patient, but the technique is, is just the same. The amount may vary, the position may vary. In this specific patient, the edema is above the upper, uh, the eyelid crease, and that patient was specifically below the eyelid crease. So it's, it will change the location, but not, nonetheless, the treatment will be the same. So you will see the patient, uh, how she came to my office and the next day, this is 24 hours leaving my office, sending uh, these pictures to her referring doctor and say, oh, that was a great, uh, great thing that you did to me. And that's when she came back. I don't know why it's, uh, it's running so fast. That this one last picture, but remember, uh, reminds also of this patient with ptosis, pretarsal edema, and again, if you look at the glabella and you see here some kind of looking like the spillage of the uh, hyaluronic acid coming from, from there uh, across that, uh, uh, that area and you treat the patient and the patient go well. Um, <clears throat> different location because of different pos potential areas of treatment come from this uh, lateral brow edema maybe because of the uh, excessive temporal uh, and brow injection, uh, and this again responds very well to uh, to to that. Again, upper sulcus too uh, too uh, uh, swollen there again for from brow injection in this patient, uh, and the treatment still is hyaluronic days and bringing it back to normal. So now you know what these two patients have in common. And again, uh, we publish always also on, on the lower lid uh, complication. Uh, in a, always in the static surgery journal. So one year apart, two different publication on uh, uh, HA related uh, to the lead specific, so specific that cause a dysmorphic changes. So something that is so striking, peculiar that you can diagnose it without uh, any further, uh, any further, further studies, pathognomonic. So this is the patient three in the lower lid, three years after, and this is uh, after. So this is, I think is important for us as ophthalmologists don't recognize this. W nobody else will. So we really need to know that in the time of hyaluronic acid injections, uh, any sort of edema in the lower lid, the first thing we need to focus on is the hyaluronic acid injection. Even if 
the injection was done years before that because the my last up to 10 years we have the longest uh, uh, occurring uh, such of a condition so uh, i invite uh, you to get in touch with me in any way you can you want to for the papers abstract discussing this so uh, 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 with this I, i'll uh, give you give it back to you thank you ferris i don't hear anybody now uh, Francesco, that was uh, really a wonderful case and an eye-opener. So I have a few questions. Um, number one, I mean, this is a very interesting case. And in fact, I had a similar case uh, where instead of the hyaluronic acid filler being done into the deeper planes, it was uh, the skin hydration filler. And patients did come after three months with, uh, you know, facial edema, angiogenic edema all over the face. So the question which would be useful for the audience and as well as I would like the comments from Sabrina and the other panelists is, uh, did you find any similarity in uh, number one, the, you know, the, the product which was used in terms of the brand, the plane and the amount of product which was used in such patients? Um, no, uh, by revising the literature in the lower lids and upper lid, first of all, the difficulties of uh, having the patient remembering what uh, injection and how she was injected. I mean, this patient have multi most of them had multiple injections all over. So they don't know, some they will tell you, no, I've not been treated. Remember, uh, have you have your lips done a few years ago? Ah, yes, my lips, yes. So if she, the patient had an injection in the nasal labial, look at the needle can get anywhere from there, like in the lower lid. Same thing you can say for the upper lid, you know, temporal uh, injections, brow injection, forehead injection, they all come down, down to, the, to the upper lid. Then the sulcus is, uh, is injected directly. So, and the glabella is also injected. So you have four, three or four areas of injection. Any filler has been uh, involved in our, in our series. Uh, there is not one really safe uh, filler, but uh, it, it is like a long, uh, uh, problem. Uh, I mean, uh, it's more, it's not because in, in the case that you, you mentioned, sugar it might have been a short term complication, possibly the wrong filler in the wrong placement. But most of these cases have been doing well for quite a long time. So one or two years, they didn't complain of anything. And then they build up this swelling. And really, they do not connect the dots and nor the, their treating physician can relate the complication to the treatment that they have done two years ago. And consider that the, the label of these fillers has been written, it will dissolve in a, a month, six months, no more than a year, not, not none after one year. So the eye, the eyelids uh, are a specific area of uh, complication related to the hyaluronic acid. That's unique presentation. You won't see any, uh, any presentation like that anywhere else in the face. So you really need not to be worried about blindness injecting the eye, but consider this. So as, as ophthalmologists, we should, you see one, you see them all. So it's just really, and then you apply upper lid, lower lid. Why would that be different? It's an orbicularis line and territory. They behave differently. And they, you know, it's respond, they respond very well to hyaluronic day. So just get used to that. But the diagnosis is the most important. I couldn't agree more. So, um, Francesco, to address your excellent presentation and Shubra's question, we forget the patient factors. You know, when we use fillers, there are so many patient-induced factors. And uh, Francesco beautifully showed this lady had all the itis. You know, she had autoimmune conditions. And uh, we see that these are often T cell mediated responses. And, you know, the CD4 counts are high. Uh, these patients then mount these responses to the fillers and delayed swelling in the periorbital area is extremely common. In fact, when I counsel patients, I tell them that from you know, repeated high volume uh, fillers, not only in the tear trough, but also in the upper cheek, uh, it compromises uh, the lymphatics and they can get uh, swelling. And I, I do feel, and I in my practice in London, I see a lot of these predisposition 
predisposed uh, from Vicross technology and the Hylocross technology. Uh, and there seems to be a predisposition, uh, particularly with, with the cross linkage and how these products then biodegrade and present themselves to certain patients. So not everybody will get it, but certain patients have this immune response to them and they will swell. And like Francesco said, you cannot miss this. It has a very funny, boggy, bluish tinge, you know, and once you see it, you can't forget it. You know, it's a filler and, you know, other oculoplastic surgeons, even in UK say, oh, this isn't filler, uh, but you, you can't miss it. And ultrasound or radiography is where this is so important because patients don't want this dissolved with hyaluronidase. Um, but, you know, a radiological investigation that shows them, uh, and if, if the filler clumps are more than two millimeters, they'll show up on ultrasound. And it's fantastic to actually show them, particularly where they don't remember what they've had injected. This woman's had silicone, then she's had, you know, HA fillers. Uh, so you really want to establish what's there before you go in and you give them the treatment or you explore. Because with silicone, you would be in trouble because you'd be chasing your tail. Um, so if I can add uh, to this, Sabrina, I put the itis just to trick uh, the audience uh, because it's nothing to do with this. I mean, in my experience, this is the only patient that I had that had a history of uh, inflammatory autoimmune disease. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do. And, and, and you know, it's just one, the only case in my upper and lower lip series going up to 60 or 70 or 80 nowadays. So uh, we see them, a bunch of them. And, and I think it's the rheology of the hyaluronic acid. It's just like how it works. We really need to remind ourselves how the degradation of hyaluronic acid is and how it behaves in the lid. So it, it is isovolumetric degradation. So it retains the volume, initial volume, by reducing its content in hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid by calling more water. So when the, uh, the balance between the water and hyaluronic acid breaks, in, in, the, in the eyelid, it starts to swell, swell up. So I don't, I, I cannot, I mean, I couldn't relate it to any specific filler. Probably the, the names you, you gave is just like, because they are more commonly used. Uh, there are so many reasons. Uh, we cannot really give all the answers. I don't, um, and the other thing I never do when I see a patient like that, I don't waste any time for any further diagnosis. I treat them right away with the other days and there's no risk of uh, uh, missing the hyaluronic acid with the silicon because silicon will not give you that. Uh, it's not calling attractive water. It's just a hyaluronic, day, a hyaluronic acid. So you treat them with the other days and 10 minutes after, I mean, the patient has no uh, swelling there. The problem with the lower leg, the patients are afraid of hyaluronic days and the injectors also. It's because they all of a sudden see an empty sulcus, the bags and such, and they really need to be advised of that and they need to be retreated again. And they can be treated again also with hyaluronic acid. So, I mean, it's a very complex, but for, I mean, the messages that I want to deliver here today, it was just, if we as ophthalmologists don't recognize the condition, I don't say everybody should be treating them, but recognize them yes we should be saying you know this is it so no need to kidney testing heart disease thyroid test you know all that you want to do a, a ultrasound just go ahead but that is what it is you say once you just refer it to somebody that can manage that Francesco that was a great yes, talk. Kat. this is cat hair I, I think that's yeah. a really good point and I agree with you um we presented this at the fall meeting at AO2, and you're right, this is so common these days. And I think I want to just repeat what you said earlier is that you don't often see this right away. I mean, you don't often see them at three months or something. A lot of times, like you mentioned, it's years later, and they don't remember that because supposedly it's worn off by then. And I would agree with you, in the eyelid area, it can be there five years, 10 years, and we have to, as you mentioned, be aware of it and just ask them because I agree. You see it once, you, you recognize it, and they'll be misdiagnosed by everybody else, and they'll just think they need more filler. But I do tend to think they come on almost like a few years later that they start to build this up. So um, I think there are certain products that are more inclined to get this, but all products can cause it. But but I agree. I, I just go ahead and inject them with hyaluronidase right away. 
but it's and really I, good thanks. to know that it, it can be happening uh, very many years later. Patient, I'm sorry. And I think, uh, I think it also makes sense now that when we are counseling the patients, it is very important to put this point across that, you know, uh, because there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, miscommunication which happens with patients about the fillers, especially in our part of the country where, you know, you need to stress upon this point that you can have these kind of complications happening any point of time because they tend to forget about this. So I think it's, it's, it's also pointing out to, uh, you know, how the counseling of the patient should be done the fact that we are seeing this, uh, you know, happening more often. Thank you. Also, I think what I'd like to add is patients do forget and they, they hop between practitioners and, you know, medical legally, it's a minefield because it's a litigious practice uh, and they forget that they've had one sort of product somewhere else and another product somewhere else and they come to you. And in fact, they may have had a reaction to their original product and uh, or an interim product, and then you're left holding the baby. So it can be quite difficult. I mean, we I have a very strict uh, four-page consent policy where we talk about swelling because swelling is extremely common, and it's not just early swelling; it's the delayed swelling that can happen, uh, you know, months or years down the road. Perfect. So this is like an extremely important thing highlighting about the fillers. Dr. Santosh, do we have any questions from yeah, the... Uh, no questions. One is from Alex Suha from uh, Philippines. He asks, how do we treat silicon dermal filler complications? Um, that is a, a very difficult uh, question. And uh, to give you a very short answer, we do not treat them because unfortunately, there are, the, that's the reason why they fell off uh, the market. You know, like there's no dealing with the complication uh, a simple like a hyaluronic days for the hyaluronic acid and surgically I've been there involved in few cases actually way too many but it's not a surgical related complication unless they really cause in a specific unique form but if you get there you, you find a, a transparent fluid oily fluid that goes everywhere so it really it's, it's like worms of uh, transparent material infiltrated everywhere so it's a too big of a uh, of a of a procedure. Like if silicone is in the lips, causing a deformation in that area, it can be open uh, through the uh, pink lip, and, and and that can be managed. Uh, so, but you know, in the face irregularities, it's like before you convince me to jump in and do surgery on them, they really need to be specifically good candidate. Uh, so the short answer is no treatment for them. I'm sorry. So no, with, uh, you know, with you? Uh, silicone, uh, Santosh, if I can uh, come in on th that, it is it, really tricky. And in UK, we have uh, a, a, like an MDT that manages it as a plastic surgeon who's highly experienced in managing these silicone complications. And uh, we work with uh, a sonologist, a radiographer, and they actually chase it. They do it like a, like a you know, uh, operation in, during the operations, a live ultrasonic chasing for really complicated cases where the silicone is creating a problem. But it's not something that someone should undertake lightly. Next question was, how do you inject hyaluronidase uh, and uh, what is the dose? Um, at first, when I did not have any personal direct experience, I followed the suggestion of uh, more experienced uh, friends. Uh, uh, and I was taught to inject 100 units of hyaluronidase days per point of edema. So average three, four points in the lower lids. So I'm talk we're talking about three, 400 units per side uh, in a given edema. I'm now down to 15 units per point and it works quite as well. Uh, so there is always time to come back and add but I don't see the point when we published the first paper and say, why are you using so little? Why don't you use more? So you're sure you get it all. But why if less works good enough, well enough, why would you need? So if a one gram of uh, antibiotic is sufficient, why take 10? I understand it works well, but you can only get more complication or uh, Actually, we don't know all, all that well the mechanism of, uh, of the uh, action of the hyaluronic days, especially related to our own uh, hyaluronic acid. So I'm sure uh, and I'm convinced there is some action on our own, uh, but we are able to restore it in 48 hours time. So if you take a picture of the patient right after hyaluronic days, you will see they are very sunken the next day. 
and then they ask them to come back in 15 days, they have rebuilt over that. So they are less sunken than the first uh, first operative, uh, post-operative, post, post-treatment uh, day. So uh, there is some action on our own hyaluronic acid. We rebuild it, but too much <laughs> hyaluronic acid is probably not a good advice. So. Right. Any other questions, Dr. Sanzo? Yes, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Francisco. Yeah. So uh, uh, anything, any message, one message from Dr. Shubhra uh, and, uh, to sum it up? There is, if, if I may, I have a quick question for Francesco. I mean, I've seen a couple of, of these patients where you would dissolve it with hyaluronidase and it would go away. But I would tend to echo with Dr. Sabrina that patients with autoimmune disease who get this type of edema, once you kind of dilute this hyaluronic acid, I think they have some sort of a disruption in the lymphatics in the eyelid. And then whenever they would get inflammatory bouts and edema, that edema would tend to go into that weak spot, if you want, and they would tend to get prolonged edema in that space. Have you seen that? Uh, Ram, see, I, I don't personally, uh, I don't have an answer for that. I'm just saying only that usually this patient with uh, vasculitis or autoimmune diseases are not really uh, targeted by um, uh, static doctor or any injector for that reason, because we don't really know what is the potential interaction between any foreign body, even the hyaluronic acid. So if that comes out, that the patient has a lupus or a scleroderma or a vasculitis, would you inject them? I wouldn't personally, uh, or I wouldn't under specific circumstances. So I do not really uh, think that has a lot to do with that, but you know, given in, in general, in general terms, I'm not here to say that's not going to happen. It can happen eventually, but we, I had never came across to any uh, patient with uh, uh, itis uh, that has been treated. And then, you know, like I need to have a specific uh, thinking process for that patient. So, yeah. Perfect. So, uh, right. can we, yeah, conclude it? Yeah, great. So, next we are going to go uh, to the keynote lecture by Dr. Kat. And I would request Dr. Partha uh, to introduce our uh, uh, esteemed guest, uh, Dr. Kat Burkett. Thank you very much, uh, Farooz. And uh, it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Kat Burkett from the University of Wisconsin, USA. Uh, Dr. Kat is Professor of Oculoplasty, Orbital and Facial Cosmetic Surgery, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, University of Wisconsin. Uh, graduate of the Harvard University and University of Rochester, fellowship from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. She's the editor of textbooks in oculofacial surgery and blepharoplasty, lead editor of oculoplastic section of the iWiki, deputy in chief iWiki, ASOPRS program chair, ASOPRS WOC liaison chair, and awards, numerous awards, but of the more important, the AAO Senior Achievement Award, nominated Secretariat Award 2019, American Journal of Cosmetic Surgery, Richard W. Aronson, Founders Award for the Best Manuscript Published, the Shapiro Research Program Award and University of Wisconsin McPherson Eye Research Institute Award, Madison Magazine Top Doctors Award. So I give to you Dr. Kat Barkat. Welcome, ma'am. Over to you, Dr. Kat. Thank you so much. Let me just, thank you so much for the invitation and for your invitation to this meeting. Um, thank you to the organizing committee, um, Dr. Farouz and everybody else. Um, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. So my talk today is a little bit different and perhaps a little controversial, but I wanted to talk about um, kind of an overview. Let me see here. Oh, it's not, hold on. Not, oh, here we go. Okay, sorry about that. So I'm gonna talk about overview of the transgender surgical care, particularly in the United States, and the concepts to how we can evaluate these patients for facial feminization as may pertain to our practices. 
So first we just need to define that sex is what's medically assigned to us at birth based on our packaging and chromosomes compared to the gender identity, which is kind of our inner sense or awareness of being a man, woman, or other. And if you remember chemistry, transgender is, um, let me just see if I can remove that, is the opposite. So if we have a male at birth who identifies with being female, this is a transgender woman. Is this out of the picture here? There we go, okay. So why are we speaking about this? This survey showed that in the United States at least, many people over 50% are being denied insurance coverage for this type of procedures or surgeries. And even those that get covered cannot find access to the appropriate physician. And really other studies have shown that medical schools and residencies are not educating or exposing our students and teach our learners to these issues. And although for trans women, hair removal from the face and changing their voices by far more common, many of them will wish to have some sort of facial feminization at some point. And it's important to recognize that although this is purely aesthetic for many of these patients, for others, it actually may be medically necessary to alleviate gender dysphoria, which is actually a DSM-5 diagnosis. And there have been studies that shown that there have been improved mental health related QOL scores after facial feminization. So whether we decide to treat this ourselves or not, it's important for us to at least listen to the patient. Where are they in their transition? Are they wanting an early change or something a little bit moderate or a little more dramatic? Recognizing that of course there are cultural and ethnic variations. And it's very important for us to consider hormone therapy first because this will decrease facial hair, skin and hair distribution and fat for at least even a year. And this is a book that is the, by Dr. Osterhood who popularized this procedure. So first we understand their aesthetic standards, male versus female faces, horizontal thirds, vertical fifths, we're all very familiar with that. And what are the differences in these male versus female faces? So Spiegel wrote this article, which is very important. And he actually took photos, digitally altered them, and then gave them to observers. And they found that the observers graded any surgical changes. So they changed kind of the different parts of the face they found that surgeries to the upper third were much more feminizing than anything done to the nose or the cheeks or their lower face. And why is this? This is because in the upper face, you have much more prominent frontal bossing, as we know, with the protrusion generally in the male forehead. This results in very prominent superorbital ridges and low set brows. Now, if we get an x-ray plain film, we can see if they have a lot of frontal sinus. If they have a lot of or very minimal air in the sinuses and the ridges are not too bad, you can actually burr these ridges down, which is a type one. If they have significantly more air and you're a little more concerned about burring, you can do a whole setback of the anterior table. And somewhere in between, you may be able to consider fillers in that kind of area of depression very carefully, of course, being aware of emboli. So again, this is, demonstrates this superorbital ridges that are very prominent. You can actually burr these very easily through an upper blepharoplasty incision. The glabellar frontal bossing is easier addressed as you can see here through a forehead lift. And you can see again, this prominent ridge. And what this does is as you flatten and contour it, it elevates the brows, creates a more feminized open orbit. And then you can simultaneously advance the scalp and change the hairline here from this male appearance. And as you also contour this central glabella, it flattens the nasal frontal angle. And what we mean by that is in the female face, this is much more obtuse compared to a sharper male angle. And so if you're flattening that, that makes it uh, more obtuse like a feminine face. Now, if a patient doesn't want to have surgery, you can consider camouflaging with a little bit of filler right here in the radix, although being very careful in that region. As mentioned, the male forehead height is quite similar, maybe a little bit higher, but they have a much more M-shaped pattern compared to a rounder shaped forehead. And this can again be changed with surgery, hair transplant, or again, excising and bringing the hairline together. We are very familiar with the eyebrows and the differences and just kind of reminding that the eyebrow height should, height should be higher in the female or feminine face, more arched, thinner tapered, and we can consider injections of botulinum to minimize the depressors in this region to help elevate that that lateral brow. And for the eyelid, this is usually very important to these patients. And I find that they often want much more of a kind of smoky eye appearance, shadow, deep sulcus. So often increasing the height of the lid crease 
taking a lot more fat out so you don't have as much of that hooding skin over the tarsal platform. So creating a deeper sulcus altogether is generally more favorable for these patients. Now as we move on to the cheeks, the masculine cheekbones are typically wider, but they don't have the prominence and height of the feminine midface. And remember that the facial fat can change after starting hormones. So you do wanna wait for that first, but this is an area that you can do fillers or fat augmentation above the malar bone to help elevate that cheek. Now, the other thing that is very easy and popular to do is actually debulking the malar fat. So you can see here, there's a lot of poochy chipmunk cheeks here and that's malar fat. And if you want to create more of a feminine face with an oval shape, you can go through a gingival approach here and take up the malar fat, going through the buccinator spreading and then taking that very carefully. And that really helps kind of soften this fullness in the malar region. And then in the nose, I don't personally do the rhinoplasty, but keeping in mind that you're wanting more of a scoop here. And again, that more obtuse angle. Again, you can fill it there gently, um, very carefully, but sometimes in the nose, you can see this angle here. Again, very different in the male and feminine face. So this is a little bit more um, kind of upturned nose. So sometimes you can consider for some patients a little botulinum here in the depressor septi or LLAN um, muscles to kind of decrease the, the flare of the nostrils and also to turn up the nose for some patients. And then of course in the lips, we wanna think about generally if you're drawing a line from the chin to the tip of the nose, the upper lip and lower lip position is usually two millimeters uh, difference here. You wanna create more of a fullness in the upper lip, more um, kind of pink show. And in some patients uh, compared to the male, you wanna shorten this space too from the subnasality to the lip. And you can just, this is just a technique to do this simply through a small incision. And that helps turn up the lip and create more fullness. These are many things that we can do in our repertoire. And then finally in the chin, um, this last portion here is the chin generally projects two to three millimeters posterior to the lower lip. Now in the gentleman uh, masculine face, you might get more kind of protrusion there. And this also results in a more deep mental labial sulcus. So for those who may not want surgery, you may want to fill the mental labial sulcus a little bit with a little filler carefully. Um, surgically, you can shave this down or at the jawline. Uh, remember the jawline generally is a little more sharper and squared off in a masculine face. And then other non-surgical option, of course, that we're familiar with is doing some botulinum toxin to the masseter muscle that can help soften these things. So these are all areas that there are techniques that we can do in our practice should we desire. But I just wanted to kind of mention that this is a more popular area of our field um, and we can be skilled experts in these areas. It's important for us to understand the concepts so that we can provide uh, competent care or refer properly to the right specialists if, if we choose not to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kett. Uh, it, it's something really different and quite interesting uh, uh, listening to you. Uh, do we have Dr. Sabrina here? Dr. Sabrina? Yeah, Dr. Shubra, uh, can I have your comment on this? And what is the scenario in India? Um, yeah, well, the scenario in India is not so pertinent as far as the sex uh, transformation is concerned, but I think the concept of feminizing a face in a female and understanding the concept of the masculine features versus the feminine features uh, go irrespective of any ethnicity or country we are talking about. So I think, yeah. And uh, let me just uh, emphasize the fact that it's not on the surface in India do things, though things do happen. Uh, people are not so open about it. And we do get cases where people ask for such procedures. Uh, unfortunately, they don't present to oculofacial plastic surgeons and they go to plastic surgeons more than to coming to us. So I think there's a long way for us to um, get such patients. But I think uh, what uh, Kat's talk was uh, emphasizing also was to understand the concepts on the masculine versus the feminine features, which is applicable in general, uh, whatever case we pick up in, in the aesthetic practice. And as usual, can't love to talk. <laughs> Dr. Sabrina, can we hear about London? So I don't have that uh, big a, a transgender practice. I do see some transgenders and generally uh, they come in for um, in the interim phase, you know, where, uh, when they, st they, they, they 
they've had their psychotherapy, they're going in for surgery, but they want to uh, have an intermediate procedure with fillers. That's why they come to me. Uh, and uh, before they're going and having uh, more permanent changes done. Um, so, uh, it, but it's not that big a market. It's still uh, very low key. I understand, you know, Bangkok is is more uh, uh, au fait with, with these procedures than, than London, uh, you know, um, as far as transgender is concerned. But I, I agree with Shubhra. It was a beautiful talk, Kat. And, you know, uh, it, nothing, I mean, we, we treat male faces and female faces differently and male and female, it starts from the skeleton. Uh, you know, they have uh, skeletal features and structurally they're different. Uh, hormonally, they're different. Their skin is different. A male skin is thicker, uh, more hairy. And uh, we just got to respect uh, the features uh, when you're re restoring men and women. Yes, Not thank you. And I, I agree that um, this is very new, even in the U.S. And obviously, there's been a lot of media with Caitlyn Jenner and other people, and it's it's still very new and and like I mentioned, very controversial. Uh, so I wasn't sure if I should present it, but I think we if we want to be cutting edge. We should at least be familiar with it so that we can understand. And like you mentioned, the just understanding the masculine, feminine facial differences because sometimes we just have men who have very prominent ridges then we can use that technique and say, yes, we can throw down those ridges and just make them look less prompt. So these are things we can use in our practices regardless of the transgender issue. And, you know, a lot of chipmunk cheeks, if we're, we're familiar taking mucous membrane from the mouth, that's a very common area. I mean, you can easily go in there, avoid the, the product duct and take some fat out. So these are things we can just do in our cosmetic practices to decrease their bulk. So again, you know, it, it's like everything else we do, we can use techniques to help bridge other areas of our practice. So I think we can, can use some of those techniques very easily in other areas. Dr. But thank Dr. you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kat. Ramzi, any comments from your side? I was wondering if you've had any uh, frontal sinus complications related to the uh, frontal bossing. Right, so I think it's important first to get a plain x-ray film to see what their sinus looks like, because if there is a very thin outer table and a lot of air, then I think I would be concerned. You could probably safely burr the ridges, but in the frontal bossing area, I would be not wanting to burr that area. And if anything, I would ask the my ENT facial colleagues who do this more in the frontal area to do that setback, as I showed earlier. I'm not as comfortable doing the, the bony setback, but um, I'll do the burring. But I think it's important to get the x-ray first to see where you are. And a lot of people, if they just don't have a lot of air, you can burr very easily and safely. But that's a good point, very important. Dr. Milind, we would like to hear your experience. Are you there, Dr. Milind? All right. Dr. Santosh, do we have any questions? We don't have a question, but I comment that we should believe in body positivity and uh, not believe in uh, gender-based uh, identity. Absolutely agree. One of the viewers. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Agree. And ultimately, we're here to make people happy and hopefully everybody's happy with how they are. I absolutely agree. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So we go on to the next speaker for the day. Uh, so I invite our international speaker, Dr. Raul. So we're going to introduce Dr. Raul. Sorry. Yeah, so I take the honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Raul, who's a very good friend of mine, and he's the current president and the founding member of Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. So he's the director of Clinica Henson Eye, Ear, Nose and Throat Foundation, and he's multi-talented. Trust me, apart from the uh, beautiful oculoplastic surgeries that he does, he's a good speaker. Uh, he does a lot of motivation speaking, uh, of course, and he is known to have introduced the first balloon dactyloplasty in Philippines. And uh, his work in oculoplasty is well recognized in Philippines as well as abroad. Over to you, Dr. Rao. Hi. Um, somehow I cannot share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay. Can you hear me, though? Uh, yes. Um, it says you cannot start screen share while the others. Okay. Are you good there. to go? Yes. Ah, great. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully you can see this slide, my slide. Yes. Okay. 
Um, I want to thank Fairuz and um, the AIOS for uh, inviting me, representing the Asia Pacific Society of Thalamic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and the Philippine Society of Thalamic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery in this prestigious uh, global webinar of the AIOS. Um, my topic for, for tonight is uh, not uncommon, and uh, mucosil is pretty much uh, all of us see mucosil. And uh, I want to uh, share you my case that we had last year. Uh, interesting case. Um, so we have VR, a 30-year-old male who came to eye, my clinic for a chief complaint of eye bulging and fullness of the right eye. This started like 10 months ago with the progressive and non-painful bulging of his right eye. And also a presence of uh, nasal congestion in the right nostril. There was no presence of uh, nasal discharge, no redness and swelling of the eye, no diplopia, and no blurring of vision. Past medical history was unremarkable. Personal history is not a non-smoker. He's a non-smoker, occasional alcoholic drinker. Uh, we go ahead to the physical exam. Uh, vision, uncorrected vision of the patient on the right eye is 20-25. The left is 20-20. Uh, pressure pressure of the eyes 30 on the right and 17 on the left. Pupils are unremarkable. EOMs are full and equal. The retina is also normal, uh, no choroidal faults on both eyes. And the Hertel's exophthalmometry on, uh, on the right eye is 23 and 16 on the left. So it's pretty much uh, proptosed. And the, there's a positive retropulsion test on the right eye. So this is uh, my patient, um, the pre-op uh, patient uh, pictures. And as you could see, he has a patient has a non-actual uh, temporal displacement proptosis of the right eye. And if you see in the superior picture, you could see it uh, very well, the proptosis. So for a differential diagnosis in this patient, uh, we were thinking of a mucosil because of uh, the nasal um, congestion. And uh, of course, a polyp, and you cannot rule out any neoplasm. Uh, mucus retention cyst, uh, any infection like a subperiodical abscess or acute sinusitis. Um, you can also have silent uh, sinus syndrome or even a uh, meningocele. So what we did was we need the nasal endoscopy. And for the first pass, uh, meaning uh, to the floor of the uh, nose, it's normal. And the second pass, there was a mass uh, obstructing the osteomedial complex right here. Um, this is the, you cannot see it, uh, this is my only picture, sorry, but this is the uh, middle turbinates, inferior turbinate, this is the nasal septum. So this is pretty much the mass protruding in the nasal cavity. So um, we did some imaging to determine the location and possible surgical approach. So we did a CT scan of the orbit and paranasal sinuses with contrast and revealed a thin-walled non-enhancing unilocular hypodense extraconal cystic mass in the right inferomedial orbital area right here. And it's uh, isodense as the uh, brain tissue. And then there's bone remodeling and erosion, the lacrimal bone and the lamina papyrosea. Basically, the cystic mass is touching the septum. And it's already inside the nasal cavity, as you could see. So uh, we might, uh, we were already considering uh, endoscopic decompression at this time. And uh, there's also displacement and distortion of the right intraconal structures right here. And uh, pacification, there's a pacification of the frontal sinuses, maxillary, and uh, and the uh, ethmoid sinuses. And th there's a connection of the, uh, right here, there's a connection between the frontal sinus and the ethmoidal sinus mucosil. So uh, with this, uh, the salient features is 30 old male, gradual and progressive non-painful bulging of the right eye, nasal congestion as the right nostril for the past 10 months, increased IOP at 30, non-actual proptosis on the right eye at 23 and left at 17. Nasal endoscopy revealed the presence of a mass below the middle turbinate and the right nostril. CT scan revealed most likely a, a mucosil. So a working diagnosis is a frontoethmoidal mucosil of the right orbit with extension out of, the sinus, uh, out of the sinus into the nasal cavity. So what we did, we did an intranasal decompression of the frontoethmoid mucosil and mar marsupialization via endoscopic nasal approach. And this is just a short video of that procedure. Um, I don't know, I, I hope it's not choppy. So as you can see, this is already the mass right here. There's a middle turbine. Once we incise it with a blade 15, uh, a lot of uh, mucus uh, already comes out and uh, we, we, we just suck it out from the uh, mucosil space. And uh, as you can see, there's so much muco mucoid uh, substance right there. And you can see this flap right here. We're going to remove all of that to marsupialize the, uh, the mucosil to the nasal cavity so that uh, the, 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 the secretions will, will freely flow in the in the uh, uh, nasal cavity. So this is still the, the, 
we are cutting it here and then uh, finally we're gonna remove the the uh, piece of uh, mucosa of the mucosil right there just for histopathology and right right there is the marsupialization and a big huge hole uh, ostrum uh, from the mucosil into the nasal cavity so this is before the compression of pictures that's the proptosis and then just right after the compression as you can see there's decrease of the proptosis and even something like of an endophthalmos right there. And this is a specimen which confirms a mucosil. And this is just a pre-op and post-op pic of the patient. This is the pre-op pic before, uh, earlier in the, in the slides. And then this is now uh, one month after. This is a, a little bit endophthalmic, as you can see from the superior view. Uh, this is before and this is after. The patient is kind of endophthalmic. I already explained to him that he will be endophthalmic because of the bone remodeling from the orbit. Just to discuss uh, quick here, uh, mucosils are benign cyst-like expansive lesions lined with circulatory respiratory mucosa of pseudostratified columnar epithelium. They are mucoid-filled masses which develop after obstruction of the sinus ostium and drainage pattern. And the most common is the frontal sinus, then the ethmoid, the sphenoid, and lastly, the maxillary. And for the clinical presentation, there are, there are numerous uh, clinical presentations, and the most common is headache, but in, in our case, our patient had nasal congestion and proptosis. Uh, which sealed the, the, the diagnosis. And then for the differentials, there's also a lot. You could have retention cysts, chronic sinusitis, anticoinal polyps, polyposis of the paranasal cavities, dermoids, epidermoids, fungal infections. And if there's bony de destruction, you could also uh, uh, consider malignancy. So for the diagnosis you, uh, of, of mucosil, you always base it on the symptoms, imaging, surgical exploration, and this histological confirmation, which, which all of it is present in this patient. That's why we have a confirmatory, di confirmatory diagnosis of uh, mucosil. The most important radiologic evaluation is a CT scan, no need for an MRI, but an MRI is served to mucosil secondary to sinusinal nasal tumors or even uh, malignant tumors. And my last slide is for the treatment, surgical station is, uh, is paramount or mars marsupialization. And the objective is to drain the mucosil from, uh, from, from the, from the in encasing and ventilate involved the, the sinus. So you open the ostomiatal complex into the nasal cavity. The approach depends on the size, location, and extent of the mucosil. So if it's uh, more of the uh, um, frontal and maxillary approach, uh, you do the external approach with the lynch howard frontal hemoidectomy or the osteoplastic flaps with sinus obliteration. But uh, getting popular now is the endoscopic approach, which is what we did. It's minim minim minimally invasive, preserves sinus structures, and leaves no scarring for the patient. I think that's all I want to invite you next year. Uh, this is Boracay Island. Uh, I want to invite you next year for our uh, Asia Pacific Society of Plant Optimic Plastic Reconstructive Surgery meeting in November. So hope to see you then. Thank you very much for inviting me. Presenting a very interesting case. Now we have our esteemed panelist here, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Javed Ali from LV Prasad. Uh, India, and uh, he is a very well-known personality in endoscopy and dacryology. And we also have Dr. David Liu from Xi'an joining as a panelist today. So Dr. Javed, it's over to you. Uh, what do you think about uh, this case and how it was managed? Yeah, thank you, Raul. Uh, that was a uh, very nice. Raul, you can stop sharing now. Yeah, I, I just cannot. Oh, there, stop share. Sorry, sorry. There you go. Yeah, so so I th I think uh, I agree. It was a very well managed case. Uh, Rahul, uh, it would also be good because you know when I was looking at those CT scans, I didn't get a lot of uh, you know I could not see uh, them in detail. But it appeared to me that there was a type three Kuhn cell of the ethmoid. So in these cases, uh, other than the marsupialization, it's good to combine a frontoethmoidal fess, uh, you know, to to be able to clear up that pathway because. Uh, otherwise, the chances of recurrence becomes a little high. The second point uh, in these is, if you look at those images, uh, the anti-ethmoidal artery to me appeared it appeared to be on the mesentery. So, you know, in, in the event that you are going towards clearing the frontal recess, there is always a possibility of an uh, anti-ethmoidal artery injury and uh, having an orbital hematoma. So that, that needs to be, uh, you know, kept in mind. But I, I think overall it was, uh, it was a very well managed case. Is David around? Uh, Dr. David? Dr. David? Let's see. He's here. 
So, uh, Dr. Javed, do you uh, manage uh, your uh, frontosinus uh, uh, frontoeth model mucosil more uh, with uh, endoscopic decompression or otherwise? External, uh, Feroz, external, de external approach, what Raul was saying uh, is not practiced anywhere. It's not a standard of care anymore globally uh, for a simple reason that anytime if you are trying to go through transconjunctival or any of those routes, um, th those are recommended to be uh, accompanied by sinus obliteration, which is, uh, you know, somewhere of stone ages. So we don't do that. The idea behind today is that these mucosils happen because the normal sinus drainage is obstructed and you want to reestablish the sinus flow back again. So I, I usually combine it with the frontoethmoidal FES uh, when I'm doing these cases. So that is what is preferred. Yes. And so in the COVID era, uh, how is endoscopy and uh, things going on, Javed? Uh, at, at present, uh, I'm not doing anything. Uh, other than very emergent cases. Uh, so hopefully once the peak declines, then hopefully we should be able to start doing things. All right. I, Dr. David is here. Dr. David. Hello, Dr. David. I think he might be muted. Can, can we check? Uh, he is uh, not muted. Yeah, Dr. David. Dr. David? Yes, so... Tairus, can I ask one question? Okay. Yes, please, go ahead. So my question is to Dr. Rahul and Dr. Mohammed, uh, Dr. Javed as well. Uh, there are some studies and some groups in the US who uh, use a steroid eluting stent to keep the marsupialized pathway open. Is it necessary to prevent recurrence or it's just uh, a trade gimmick? No, uh, we, we really don't need those things because, you know, otherwise... Uh, you know, doing a simple FES uh, and uh, antrostomies usually keep it very well open. Provided the important thing is that you don't shear the edges of the mucosa. As long as you preserve the edges of the mucosa, uh, we don't need any of those things. And I also saw in the imaging on the CT scans that the maxillary sinus was also uh, yeah. completely obliterated. It was full with me. Yeah. So you need to do a maxillary FES as oh, well. Yes. Oh, yes. Because that could be the site of recurrence again if Absolutely. it is not drained completely. I, I totally agree. David here. Uh, maybe you could comment. David, Dr. David Liu. Uh -huh. Dr. Ferus, your mic is off. Uh, Dr. Santosh, do we have any other questions? No questions at all on this. <laughs> no questions. Okay. And David, are you there before we go on to the next? Uh... I think uh... Uh, he has. Uh... Dr. David? All right. Yeah, we can come back to this once, David. Okay. Long, yeah, yeah. All right. So we go to the uh, next case of the day uh, by Dr. Sushma. I invite Dr. Somshila Murthy uh, to kindly introduce uh, Dr. Sushma. Thank you once again, Feroz. Again, I've been given this very introducing Dr. Sushma and the Krishna. She, having finished her basic medical education at Bangalore Medical College in Bengaluru, she further went on to do her long-term fellowship in orbit oculoplasty and ocular oncology at Giridhar Eye Institute in Kochi, where she also worked for some time. And currently, she's a con consultant in the ocular oncology, oculoplasty and orbit service at Narayan Netraria. One personal uh, uh, comment I have for you, Sushma, is just that I just read your paper just a few days ago which was on uh, congenital granuloma and the splendor heavily phenomenon of a patient who had a congenital granuloma, very well written. So I'm looking forward to your talk as well. Great. So over to you, Sushma. So at the end of this presentation, we are going to take go back to Dr. David and uh, take his opinion on that. Sushma, over to you. Please share your uh, slides. Just one moment, sorry. Yes, uh, is my screen visible? Not yet. If we can share the screen. Just one moment. Oh, 
sorry i'm not able to share my screen just one moment ma'am is my screen visible now yes it is you can expand it sushma yes uh thank you dr somashila for that kind introduction thank you aos for the opportunity uh good evening all uh i'm here to present an unusual presentation of a silent sinus syndrome masquerading as a double elevator palsy appropriate uh, informed consent was taken from the patient for the disp uh, display of photographs and videos he was a 63 year old gentleman with a history of binocular vertical diplopia of 4 years duration he was a hiker and he specifically mentioned difficulty in depth perception no comorbidities and he had consulted elsewhere and was diagnosed as a case of double elevator palsy his ophthalmic examination revealed a best corrected visual acuity of 2020 and 6 he had left hypertrophia and a head tilt to the left on uh, prism bar cover test he had a left hypertrophia of 16 uh, prism diopters for near and 18 prism diopters for distance his left hypertrophia was increasing on right gaze and on the left head tilt this was his ocular movements the abduction was full there was restriction of levo elevation as seen here there was restriction of elevation as well and restriction of uh, dextro elevation and there was an uh, overaction of the inferior obliques uh, his depression was unremarkable however uh, however the dextro depression was uh, restricted his ductions were tested as well and there was a uh, restriction of supra duction of the right eye and his anterior segment and fundus examination was unremarkable uh, with this clinical background uh, our strabismologist colleagues could think of double elevator palsy that was thought of elsewhere however the prism bar cover test and the pax three step test refuted the diagnosis then a diagnosis of a left superior oblique palsy was made by a strabismologist colleagues however the restriction in elevation was not so classical and the patient did not have any features uh, uh, matching of that of the paralytic squint hence uh, we thought of uh, with the clinical background of an acquired vertical diplopia of 4 years duration we could think of a thyroid associated orbitopathy or myositis was also one of our differential diagnosis ocular myasthenia gravis and also orbital floor fracture however the patient did not have any history of uh, trauma in the past so on a second look he had a deep uh, superior sulcus on the right side an increased pretarsal lid show and on worms eye view uh, there was difference in the position of the of both eyeballs which was further confirmed by hertel's exophthalmometry he had a right hypoglobus of 3 mm and on a closer look his left eye had inferior scleral show thereby increasing our suspicion towards thyroid orbitopathy hence an mri orbit was ordered and we could see this the obliteration of the right maxillary sinus the sagging down of the right orbital floor uh, thereby displacing the right inferior rectus muscle also the right orbital floor was lower in position and in this picture we could see Uh, the configuration of the inferior rectus muscle on the right side being different than that of the left so uh, based on these mri features a diagnosis of a silent sinus syndrome was made a brief discussion on the silent sinus syndrome it was first described by so parker et al in 1994 it has its peak incidence in third to fifth decade of life with an average hypoglobus measuring 3.4 mm the condition is slowly progressive attributable to the asymptomatic nature of the chronic maxillary sinusitis uh, the obstruction of the maxillary sinus leads to chronic hypoventilation leading to a build up of a negative pressure within the sinus causing the osteolysis of the walls of the sinus thereby uh, the transmission of the negative pressure, uh, pressure gradient across the vacant orbital floor leading to the collapse of the orbital floor and consequently leading to inophthalmos and hypoglobus so uh, it can present with uh, intermittent or uh, constant vertical double vision as in, seen in our patient with or without limitation of ocular movements and the fibrosis or loss of elasticity of the inferior rectus muscle uh, has been hypothesized as the cause of the ipsilateral supraduction so how will we uh, manage uh, these cases is that uh, mild cases can be managed with the uh, 
effects alone obviating the need for orbital floor reconstruction however severe cases needs an orbital floor reconstruction in addition to the drainage of fes there has been a case report of a mild silent sinus syndrome wherein the vertical diplopia was successfully treated with prism glasses alone uh, there has been a case report of a non surgical approach using hyaluronic acid gel to correct the inophthalmos after uh, middle meatal antrostomy for uh, silent sinus syndrome Uh, our patient has been asked for an ENT consultation uh, for the treatment of chronic ma chronic maxillary sinusitis and uh, the silent sinus syndrome, and then reassess the diplopia. Usually, in mild cases, the diplopia will be resolved with uh, fes alone. So, depending on the uh, persistence of diplopia later, uh, we would uh, like to uh, decide on the orbital floor reconstruction. Thus. Uh, i would like to conclude that a facial inspection with respect to symmetry was able to identify uh, this rather unusual cause of vertical diplopia and that the orbital imaging was able to confirm the diagnosis thus this case taught me that there is more to it than meets the eye thank you thank you dr sushma uh, over to you dr roshmi and dr lakshmi so if you want to take us through this case dr uh, roshmi and uh, have you seen uh, what are the varied presentation of silence uh, silence sinus syndrome that you have seen in your practice and more okay uh, am i audible yes right so if we go down to the basics this comes down to our uh, instinctic training as oculoplastic surgeons to automatically look at both sides of the face most of the silent sinus syndromes i've seen otherwise they talk about one eye being smaller or one eye being larger and very often the patient uh, himself or herself doesn't know which one it is whether one eye became smaller or the other eye became larger so that is when looking at old photographs becomes very helpful however this particular patient was different because diplopia as a presentation of silent sinus syndrome is not very common and once again when we are talking about diplopia uh, you know something that doesn't match a typical feature of a cranial nerve palsy we really need to look at the orbit so that is where we need to keep multiple uh, you know differential diagnosis in mind dr lakshmi yeah am i audible am i audible yes yes yeah uh, thanks for faruz and team uh, i think the uh, silent sinus syndrome as such is a very controversial diagnosis thanks for presenting this interesting case because somewhere down the line we have to wonder what could have been the pathology because it's not just a deformity in in the formation of the sinus maybe there's a build up of the mucosae maybe like in a city of bangalore there's a lot of allergic fungal sinusitis allergic rhinosinusitis or there's a little bit of displacement of the turbinate so some kind of pathology we have to pick up and last but not the least i would say we are, it may be an uh, the collapse or the implosion of the maxillary sinus per se it could be an early on the early aspect of vaginas vaginas is known to have collapse of the maxillary sinus that is one of the first features of presentation so i think um, you have done a very good imaging it's not a bad idea to go for a ct scan also because you need to know the bony dimensions and going for an exploratory fes where you can get the pathology there to see whatever it is the sinus though it has collapsed is full of secretions try to take it out no reconstruction at this stage get at this stage get a good biopsy done and afterwards plan on now make a nice hiatus semilunaris opening the maxillary sinus should be well open just like raul's case where the fronto ethmoidal mucosal this the main thing is with the endoscope we have to make a large opening with the sinus opening or the sinus recess which should be kept open there so that the build up of secretions doesn't occur again all the walls could be collapsed but the most important thing is to reconstruct the floor at the later stage because the patient has presented with diplopia you can see the whole content there bowing down like a hammock so that has to be taken care of so though we say silent sinus syndrome 
most of the times I feel there is some pathology which is going on, which has to be really taken care of. Even sometimes carcinomas can present like this. Of course, here the patient doesn't look so, but nevertheless, please plan a FES with a biopsy first, then the reconstruction. Thank you. That's a good message, Dr. Lakshmi. We have Dr. Don over here. Uh, before we go on to a keynote uh, lecture, Dr. Don, what do you, uh, uh, can you just share your experience about silent sinus syndrome in your practice? Well, um, we do see a fair amount of it, and I, and I think um, Dr. Lakshmi is correct. I think it, um, it can be uh, somewhat controversial as to how it's treated. I think, you know, there is usually occlusion of the maxillary sinus ostium. And then, as we all know, the, by nature, the sinus lining is a um, mucus clearing um, mechanism. So once you close off the ostium, you naturally get a negative pressure that builds up because these cells are used to pumping against this fluid gradient. So just by closing the ostium, you get this negative pressure that will pull in the, the uh, and collapse the antrum. So I think just opening up that ostium and um, allowing aeration, um, typically sometimes you don't even have to put an orbital floor implant. So I think some uh, manage it differently. The ones with severe implosion do need an implant, particularly if there's a lot of bone resorption. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Santosh, do we have any questions on uh, the orbits? You're muted. You're muted. There's a common question to Rahul and Roshmi. How do you manage residual inophthalmos in these conditions? By Vishal Sharma. Okay. Uh, if there's residual inophthalmos for this, it would be a preferable inophthalmos plate. A porous polyethylene shaped plate for the floor. The other option is a hand carved silicone. You can get a medical grade silicone block and carve it out by hand. These would be my two options. Raul, how about you? Raul? Do we have Dr. David here? Dr. David? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, hi. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. So yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. have some comment about the case present by Johansson. Uh, can you hear? Yes, slightly uh, break. But what we, we do... Uh, your audio is not... Uh, it's breaking. You can hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I have some comment about the case presented by Johansson. Uh, oh. In China, some, some case was presented by the sudden bungee of the eyeball. Now, now the, this case showed the slowly uh, bungee of the eyeball. The second one, we sometimes we use a uh, orbit MRI to differentiate and show some malignancy of it. And some case, when we remove the mucosal, as uh, maybe cause some kind of... Uh, uh, in ophthalmos. So I usually use some observable material to repair the uh, medial wall of orbit to prevent from the post-operative in ophthalmos. Uh, and another, uh, the survey approach, I usually choose, it's up to the location of the mucous cell. If the location in the medial and superior, I sometimes use the combination with the transcranicular and the sub, uh, sub approach in some case, if only located in the medial part of the orbit, I will use the endoscope to do the decompression. That's in my comment. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. So we are not having any more questions on this, Dr. Santosh? All right. So uh, we are going on to the, uh, the next uh, talk by uh, Dr. Kikawa, who is my mentor. And I'm really, really happy to have him here early in the morning in San Diego. It should be around 6 a.m. And he obliged. So may I request Dr. Partha uh, to kindly introduce our uh, esteemed uh, international speaker and the keynote speaker, Dr. Kekawa. Over to you, Dr. Partha. Thank you so much, uh, Farooz. And uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to present to you Dr. Don Kekawa, Shiley I Institute, San Diego, USA. Professor in Chief, Division of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and Vice Chairman, 
UC San Diego, Department of Ophthalmology and Shaili Eye Institute, La Jolla. Joint appointment as Professor of Surgery Division of Plastic Surgery, UC San Diego. Fellowship Director of UCSD, Oculoplastic Fellowship. Former Program Director, UCSD, Residency Program. Lifetime of Achievement Award from the AAO 2019 and past president, American Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Board of Trustees, APS, OPRS Foundation, Editorial Board, Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal, and Board of Director of American Board of Ophthalmology. We present to you, Dr. Don Okikawa. Thank you, Dr. Partha and Dr. Farouz for your kind invitation. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Great. Well, um, I'm, uh, thank you again for the invitation. I, I know um, we've all seen the one of all the detriments of the global pandemic and this may be one of the few positives where we get to see and meet with our colleagues on a regular basis. So when um, <clears throat> Feruz first told me about the theme, <clears throat> excuse me, of the symposium X-Files, I thought, well, maybe I should talk about aliens in the orbit. And uh, we all know that aliens come in different sizes. There's small ones and medium-sized ones, and there's large ones. Um, but if we look at the definition of aliens, it's usually, you know, if you look in the dictionary, coming from another world, another definition of aliens are differing in nature or character, typically to the point of incompatibility. And uh, that's going to be the topic of our talk today. So orbital aliens are foreign bodies that we see. And um, for many of you probably thought this talk was going to be about parasites or something like that. And I think, um, you know, the Indian colleagues probably have the most uh, experience in that. So for me to give a talk on that would, would not be appropriate. But we do see some foreign bodies and, you know, foreign bodies comes in, in different shapes, different sizes and different compositions. And if you look at the compositions, we can usually break down them into two broad categories. There are organic uh, foreign bodies, which consist of wood and vegetable matter. And then there are non-organic, which typically can be metallic or non-metallic. And non-metallic ones consist of plastic, glass, and fiberglass. So in general, foreign bodies are, uh, fall into some um, typical rules that we follow. Most everyone would, would remove an organic foreign body. You know, these are typically decomposed. They can harbor uh, fungus and they can lead to problems if not removed. I think for metallic foreign bodies, most of the time we will leave them if they're not causing functional problems. What about the category of the non-metallic, non-organic, the plastic materials? Well, as you all know, we put implants in the orbit and these are typically some sort of metallic, uh, excuse me, non-metallic plastic or synthetic material. And these can be very well tolerated in the cases of fractures. So I think in large part, these fall into the category if they're not causing any problems, let's, let's leave them. What about imaging? Well, I think the, the, the gold standard is usually the non-contrast CT. Uh, MRI can be useful maybe not as an initial screening uh, test because we don't know if there are any ferromagnetic elements, but it can be useful for organic materials. Uh, angiograms should be used to rule out any vascular involvement, particularly with larger foreign bodies. And then plain films are usually used for screening. For example, in cases where you don't know what could be in the orbit, you get a plain film to determine if there's any ferromagnetic elements, and then you proceed with any sort of additional imaging. Well, let's look at a small foreign body. So uh, this is a 14 month old boy who presented two days after swelling uh, with, excuse me, with swelling after play with siblings. And the mother noticed that he has vomited twice since. And I don't know if any of you, many of you probably do have children and sometimes they play on their own and in the room adjacent to where the adults are. And, and you hear a lot of playful laughter and then suddenly everything just goes quiet. And then a couple seconds later, one of them starts crying very loudly. So this is what happened to this mother. She didn't witness it. She didn't know what happened, but she did know that something happened. Of course, talking to all the other siblings, they all deny that anything happened, but the, the child starts vomiting a couple times and his eyelid starts to swell. 
And on examination, he has good um, uh, extracurricular movement, his visual acuities and fixes and follows. And, and I asked the mother about this little red spot here. And she said, oh, no, that's not a, an entry wound. He, that's a little nevus that he has. So that's not anything that would um, you know, raise any suspicion. And here it is a little bit on higher view. And you can see that's a nevus. But the lid is very swollen. Uh, there's discharge and possibly a little bit of hypoglobus. So um, I think the suspicion that there may be something going on here is quite high, given the systemic um, uh, um, involvement with the nausea and the vomiting. So we did order a scan. And this is a uh, um, bone film of a plain CT scan, axial view. And you'll see, well, things look pretty good. There's no obvious foreign body. And there may be something here. This looks kind of like a, a bone spur. Is that a bone spur? What is that? It's along the roof of the orbit. Um, and then uh, on 3D reconstruction, you can see that this does not really look like anything uh, that could be a bone spur. This actually looks like a linear object. And you'll notice that um, this is, is very close to bone density. So whatever it is, is, is not metallic, but it's probably you know, something that has very similar characteristics to bone. So we decide to, to do uh, um, exploration. And uh, we took the patient to the operating room and immediately we try and look to see, is there any sort of entry wound? So we look in the upper fornix and we do find that there is a penetrating wound in the upper conjunctiva. So very likely that leads to high suspicion that there is something in there. And then because this wound is so small, we end up making a lid crease incision, subperiosteal plane, tracking along the superior roof of the orbit. And lo and behold, we find a, a uh, graphite uh, segment from a pencil. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, well, are pencil tips organic or are they non-organic? We, we know that uh, graphite is probably uh, the largest component of, of these pencil tips. And, and to me, that's, that's probably kind of a non-organic source, but there is small amounts of clay that is located in the pencil tip. So they're kind of a mixture of the organic and the non-organic. So let's move on to medium-sized foreign bodies. So this is a 43-year-old uh, surfer who was in Mexico surfing and got knocked over by a rogue uh, wave. And it just so happened that his surfboard hit him just above his, his left eyebrow. And um, he didn't think anything of it. And he went to the local emergency room and they saw laceration above his brow. And uh, they closed the incision and he came uh, about a week later to us for suture removal. So here he is on presentation. You can see he's got a, um, a linear laceration above his brow. Uh, but his lid is swollen, and, and you can see that his, uh, if you look at his vertical globe position, he definitely has hypoglobus by a couple millimeters. And um, we start to, to suspect, well, you know, that's really more hypoglobus than is out of proportion to what the swelling is, and, and we decide to get imaging. Uh, here's his extraocular movements, and the other thing that tips us off is, well, he doesn't have full up gaze. Down gaze is good and side gaze is good, but his up gaze is limited. Um, he actually has enophthalmos, which is a surprising thing in his left eye. So um, it goes maybe a little bit against what you might think if there's some foreign body pushing his eye down, wouldn't he have uh, proptosis or exophthalmos, but his eye is actually in. So here's um, his um, um, coronal imaging. Uh, you can see anteriorly, you start to see this, again, bone density um, um, kind of uh, um, radiographic uh, characteristics. You see this linear line that extending further into the orbit starts to assume this V-shaped characteristic. So it looks like starting from the back of the orbit, it kind of wraps around the medial wall, comes down on the floor, comes back up. And then we see the tip of it right here along his superior orbit. So uh, not knowing what this is, we start to feel, and you can actually feel along his superior orbit rim, there's a little uh, palpable foreign body. On um, uh, axial imaging, you can start to see again, this very oddly shaped uh, weird location of this, um, what appears to be some bone density object. 
So we take him to the operating room and, and we make a lid crease incision. And this is his, uh, the larger arrow here points to his superorbital rim. And just below that, you start to see this object, this um, what appears to be a shard of fiberglass. So we start to slowly pull this out of his orbit. Here we are about halfway. And here's the entire shard of fiberglass as it exits. And you can see that it has this curvilinear um, orientation and it measures about 55 millimeters. And we're thinking to ourselves, well, gee, the orbit's only 40 millimeters. How do we get this 55 millimeter object in there? Well, well naturally with the curvature of the fiberglass, it kind of wrapped around the entire orbital apex. Um, he had a nice result, his vision was intact, and you can see on up gaze and down gaze, he did quite well. Um, the way surfboards are made, however, is that they usually have a core of styrofoam and they have a, plus, uh, excuse me, a fiberglass coating around the styrofoam. And what had happened with him, the little tip of the uh, surfboard just hit his orbital rim below the surface and a shard of fiberglass had sheared off and it's almost like peeling a carrot where the, the tip of the carrot just goes in and then the, the board with its momentum gets pulled away. And that shard of fiberglass uh, had the effect of peeling and going around the orbit. And lucky for him, it avoided any major uh, neurovascular structures and his, his function was intact. So let's go on to the large uh, foreign body, which is the, which is the last uh, the case that I have. Um, I don't know about um, um, how many of you had heard in the, the news that uh, several years ago, we, we had a lunatic um, that was actually targeting homeless men in San Diego and, and driving railroad spikes through them and, and killing them. And it was such a tragic um, um, event. Uh, the man was apprehended and, and is now uh, serving a, a life sentence. Um, but we happened to see, unfortunately, one of the victims of this, um, uh, of this tragedy. Um, we uh, had a, a middle-aged male uh, stat present status post-assault to our emergency room. Um, he had altered mental status. His uh, primary trauma survey revealed stable vital signs and intact um, um, you know, airway breathing and circulation was fine. Uh, his secondary trauma survey, however, did show the, the findings uh, here uh, that we'll discuss. Uh, because of his unresponsiveness, vision was unable to be checked. He did have fixed and non-reactive pupils. His uh, right eye um, did have uh, motility. The left eye was completely um, ophthalmoplegic. Uh, he did have, have um, proptosis in the left eye greater than the right. And his um, undilated fundus exam did show the right nerve to be of normal limits. However, the left uh, nerve was uh, pale uh, and edematous. Um, here he is on a presentation. You can see here that there's this transverse foreign object that was uh, driven in from the left side. Uh, with the indentation, and this is the, the bowing of the right side, which is the tip of the spike here shown in side view. Um, here is the uh, tip of the, where it was driven in. And this here uh, upper asterisk was, was an attempt to drive the spike further. And luckily for this gentleman, uh, that was unable to be done. Uh, and he did survive this incident. Um, this is a plain, uh, excuse me, a CT scan showing extensive artifact here, and this pretty much precludes the use of CT uh, as a good imaging device. So this is the one uh, case where a plain film could help you. And you can see that this foreign body is completely outside the cranial cavity. And this is even uh, further um, accented here. You can see uh, the horizontal foreign body completely located behind the orbits. The upper cranial vault uh, is fortunately intact. So what goes into removing something like this? Well, um, we did perform preoperative uh, cerebral uh, angiography. And just to orient you here in the center, this is what a normal angiogram looks like. You can see the ophthalmic artery here branching off the internal carotid. On the right side, this is the object. This is the um, ophthalmic artery, which did have some circulation. And on the left side, it was completely missing. The ophthalmic artery circulation was completely cut off. So there are some preparations that's required to removing a large object like this. Uh, there's a Mayfield holder to immobilize uh, the cranium. Uh, both carotid arteries uh, were um, isolated and uh, with, with possible ligature if needed for either side in case there was a, a large uh, vascular event. Um, the wounds uh, cutaneously were uh, extended to um, 
isolate and expose the surrounding bone to facilitate removal. This is the entry point, this is the exit point. Um, this is where we show removal of the actual spike. Um, and we do have um, a video on, as to how that occurred. So because it was wedged in so firmly, a blunt malleable uh, was needed to uh, free it up. And here is the spike being removed. Um, you can see there's a large uh, transcranial defect now, just a very small um, arterial pumper. Uh, and with the endoscope, you can actually visualize this defect uh, across the entire transcranial um, space. Um, that's some fibrin glue being applied. Um, here's a uh, diagram uh, of, of what the spike looked like. I'm sorry, this is in inches. It's about a seven inch uh, spike. Uh, which is about 17 centimeters in length. And this is the um, photo showing the, the defect. Um, repeat uh, imaging did show uh, patency of the right ophthalmic artery. Unfortunately, the left was completely occluded. So we did have some hope that there might be some um, vision in the right eye. Um, how, do, how we filled the defect was it was packed with abdominal fat grafting and then uh, skin closure. Um, he, he was uh, kept uh, sedated and his pupils did remain uh, unreactive, non-reactive. Um, the, all the cultures were negative from the wound site. Um, here he is at one month. He did have bare light perception in his right eye and left eye. He had complete ptosis and ophthalmoplegia and had no light perception. Um, unfortunately, he did lose vision uh, three months later in the right eye and, and um, uh, was left with no light perception in both eyes. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, follow-up uh, with this gentleman uh, <clears throat> has been that he did maintain his uh, uh, mental status. However, he, he did have uh, complete loss of vision in, in both eyes. And it's just an unfortunate, unfortunate tragedy for this gentleman. Um, so in summary, um, orbital foreign bodies do come in all shapes and sizes. Good results can be obtained with removal. Uh, sometimes, but not always, vital structures are spared. And I'd like to thank the All India uh, Ophthalmological Society and Dr. Feirouz for the uh, kind invitation uh, to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kikawa. Uh, so can I take a comment from Dr. Kasturi here regarding, you know, your experience with orbital foreign bodies? At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Don. This is a wonderful presentation showing all the small, medium and the large orbital foreign bodies. Yes, in India, this is not very uncommon. And especially in my place of the country, we do get lots of bullet injuries and lots of other firearm injuries. But the image is such a big foreign body I have not encountered in my life. And this is something amazingly you all have managed and have managed in a very good and nice way. And in India, the other common orbital aliens are basically the bamboos or the branches, I mean, the small twigs or the branches. And these are basically, uh, and also we do get loss of organic foreign bodies here. But um, this is a country where you get all types of foreign bodies and, but the most important, how do you manage it? And you have very rightly mentioned that a non-contrast city is the investigation of choice for such type of metallic foreign bodies and it should be, MRI should not be the first option unless and until it's an organic foreign body. Thank you, Dr. Kikawa. It's an amazing case. I'm sure everyone is like, you know, all with the uh, case that you presented, like, you know, going transverse from one orbit to the other. Dr. Grover, have you ever come across something similar or very similar to this anytime in your, you know, many, many years of practice in oculoplasty? First of all, welcome, Don. Those mm -hmm. are exceptional cases. Uh, a 55 millimeter foreign body uh, in, yes. a, in an orbit with vision spared. Um, that's amazing. And, and life spared with a huge foreign body like the one in your third case. Exceptional cases and uh, really amazing and representative of all that we can get starting from plastic, organic foreign bodies and otherwise. We do tend to get a lot of pellets as well besides the organic foreign bodies that Kasturi mentioned. Accidental or sometimes... Uh, used by forces and um, they can have uh, terrible consequences to the globe but sometimes when the globe is spared the optic nerve injuries and if they have not injured any structures then of course they can be left alone uh, an amazing array of foreign bodies that we can all encounter and thank you don for bringing it out for all of us 
Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, Dr. Santosh, your experience and is there any questions? Wonderful cases. I, I don't have much personal experience with large foreign bodies. I, Don did a great job. I have just one question from one of the viewers, Anaga. What do you do for uh, gun pellets and gun uh, bullet fragments that are residual in the orbit? Dr. Kikawa? Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, largely if they're asymptomatic, uh, they can be followed. Um, we, we have seen our share of uh, bullet fragments and, and, and shotgun pellets. And, and I think if there is no um, functional deficit, vision is intact, motility is intact, uh, we can observe them. And, and I'm sure those of you who've been in and, and thinking it's easy to find these, it, it sometimes can be very difficult to find. So sometimes you end up causing more damage than, than good by trying to remove it. Um, and I'm not aware of too much um, uh, heavy metal toxicity from these. I mean, I think that is the other concern. If, if it's lead, you have to think about possible lead exposure. And, you know, probably it wouldn't be a bad idea to check um, toxic, uh, heavy metal toxicity from a serum standpoint. But most of the time, if they are asymptomatic, I think we, we watch them. Uh, some of the recent reports uh, with the current pellets suggest that there is very little systemic absorption because these are now alloys or they are coated with other materials. So there were some earlier reports which suggested that there was some systemic absorption and the lead levels were higher. But the more recent uh, pellets tend not to cause systemic toxicity. So they're better left alone. Yes, sir. I have got few cases of more than 10 years of follow-up. And like they're just following them up. Nothing much. We're just like they're not having any toxicity or any adverse effects. Thank you very much. So we go on to the next uh, case, uh, the X-Files by uh, Dr. Joita. So I take this uh, wonderful opportunity to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Joita here. Sorry, okay. So uh, Dr. Joita is uh, a consultant in orbit and oculoplastic surgeon uh, at Disha Eye Hospital, Calcutta, India, uh, the west of India. And uh, she is a former consultant uh, of Sadhguru Netra Chikalsalya in Chitraput, uh, where you know it is one of the most prominent and renowned institute in India, where they do a lot of uh, oculoplasty. I'm sure she has done a lot of trauma case, orbital fractures and orbital foreign body as well. So today she is going to take us through a beautiful reconstructive technique in a very interesting case. And uh, uh, she is a reviewer of various uh, uh, journals and a great academician as well. Over to you, Joita. Kindly share your screen. My screen is visible. Am I audible now? Yes, Joita. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, AIA Scientific Committee and Dr. Feroz for this kind invitation. Today, I'll be presenting one case uh, titled Switch Flap, Closing the Gap. I have no financial interest and I have informed consent was taken. We all know that eyelids are complex structure and uh, surgical reconstruction is a challenging task because of its functional and anatomical complexity. And the difficulties of lid reconstruction multiply when it combined with other components like simplifarone. I'll be presenting here management of one such case. This is a four month old baby presented to my clinic. Uh, see, he was born on 37 week of gestation to non consanguineous parents. His elder brother also had similar defect in the left eye only. On examination, his vision, he was following torchlight and moving objects steadily. There was no nystagmus. In external examination, the both eye upper lid has a large coloboma of 15 millimeter with simply furrow. There was bro alopecia at the junction of medial two third and lateral one third. The ocular surface was totally dry. There was focal corneal erosion, superior delin, and inferior keratinization. The pupil was normal. The anterior chamber was well formed. IOP measured by tonopin was 14 millimeter of mercury. In the posterior segment examination, it was unremarkable, no disc or choroidal col coloboma. He has no other systemic uh, illness other than he has a um, dimple at the tip of the nose. So 
my case uh, meets the two criteria, major criteria, that is abortive simbleferon, cryptothalamus or congenital simbleferon, affected sibling, and one minor criteria, that is nasal malformation. So the provisional diagnosis of my case is a bilateral abortive cryptothalamus in a case of Fraser syndrome. So uh, the, the so the uh, patient has a good visual uh, potential, but it is endangered by the extensive uh, exposure keratopathy. So early surgical management was planned. The aim of surgical intervention was the preservation of vision, minimize the ocular surface exposure, glow protection, enhance comfort, and of course, cosmesis. But the challenges of surgical reconstruction in this case are there is bilateral large upper lid defect to repair almost 75 percent defect. There are inadequate uh, periorbital surrounding tissue because of in a, uh, underdevelopment of the child, this very small kit. There is lack of tissue laxity, and we also have to think of amblyopia if we are doing some lid sharing procedure. So the first reconstruction technique option is glabular flap. Uh, flap from the uh, glabular area will be transposed to the uh, upper lid, but in this case, it is not possible because it is bilateral one. The next option is trusoconjunctival graft from the other eye with superior orbicular transposition flap and full thickness skin graft. This is also not feasible in this case because it is bilateral. Next is sliding trusoconjunctival graft with full thickness uh, free skin graft. Uh, but in this small kit, I don't want to uh, take the graph because it, it, there may be, uh, may not be viable. This graph may not be viable and uh, there is some um, donor site compl uh, complication would be there. So the next is cutler BR reconstruction. Uh, this is the classical uh, one, but the problem of cutler BR, but I think that we have to keep the bridge for at least four to eight, uh, six weeks. So there is more chances of um, amblyopia and uh, the, um, there will be uh, some residual uh, lower lid um, instability in Cutler VR. So my plan was different. I managed this case with a bilateral lower lid mustardy switch flap under general anesthesia. The principle of this is switching of the full thickness flap from the lower lid to the upper lid on a pedicle based on both uh, can be either medial or lateral to bridge the upper eyelid defect. So here is a small video uh, of this procedure. The upper lid um, defect is major and it is replicated to lower lid. The vertical length is measured. Four millimeter hinge is marked. The edges of the defect is freshened by sub dissection with a radiofrequency cautery. The conjunctiva and the episcleral tissue are gently dissected and the bulbar conjunctiva was exposed. Then the dissected conjunctiva and the episcleral tissue are reposed, uh, glued to the bulbar surface by fibrin glue to form the phonics. Next is full thickness switch flap is fastened from the lower eyelid as is marked. The care has been taken to keep the pedicle at least four millimeter for the marginal artery supply. Then the lateral canthopromic anthoplasty done to mobilize the flap. First, the lower eyelid uh, defect is opposed by vertical mattress suture by 6O silk. Next, the flap is rotated 180 degree and suture to the remnant uh, lateral part of the upper lid by 6O silk. Then rest of the flap is sutured to the defect in layers by layer fashion by 6O polyglactin. The lower lid is defect is closed also by layer by layer fashion. Finally, lateral canthoplasty was done. After three weeks, the pedicle was divided. And you can see nicely reconstructed the lid and also the phonix. So this is the first month post-operative picture of the uh, baby. And you can see there is nicely formed uh, upper lid. And the most striking feature is you can see the, the surface of the um, ocular surface is moist and it is getting clear. There is no exposure 
this is the sixth month and the uh, photograph of the same child. So this is primary gaze pre-operative. This is the post-operative six month picture. And this is the closed view or uh, eye view of pre-operative uh, before surgery, pay, surgery. And this is the post-operative six month picture. There is the leader closing very well. So the advantage of mustard uh, flap is, it is the only procedure um, which provides upper lid reconstruction with natural looking lashes. It provides a steady lid with good contour and intact lid margin. It maintains good upper lid mobility with a minimum donor side morbidity. But the disadvantages are it is a two stage procedure which needs uh, multiple sitting of uh, general anesthesia. There may be some lateral uh, canthus deformity. There is, though it is small, but still there is a risk of amblyopia. It is a technically difficult procedure and it demands delicate tissue handling. So to conclude, mustard is switch flap is a useful technique in the armamentarium of upper lid reconstruction. If it is used judiciously, the results are gratifying. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joita. It's an excellently managed case. So I uh, would like Dr. Abjit Kaur uh, and uh, Dr. Mukesh Sharma, uh, the panelist uh, for this case, to take over. Dr. Abjit and Hello. Dr. Joita, you can stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Joita, first of all, you've really done a good job. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is that maybe a traction suture to, to give a lower downward traction would help prevent some amount of retraction of the um, sort of your flap. Now, uh, the second thing is that this glue that you used to uh, fix the upper uh, bulba conjunctiva, at that stage, the only thing that needs to be identified is the insertion of the superior rectus muscle. Yes, ma'am. It has been taken care. Yeah, that's the only thing. Yes, Otherwise, it's a well done job. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mukesh, your comments? Dr. Mukesh, you're not audible. Not audible yet. Dr. Mukesh, you're not audible. Admin, can you please help Dr. Mukesh? Sunil? Trying to, he has to unmute himself. Okay. Uh, Mukesh, unmute yourself, please. He is unmuted, uh, Mr. Sunil. Okay, may I uh, ask Joy yes. something in the meanwhile till Mukesh comes yes. on? Yes, yes, uh, carry on, Dr. Uh, you you have uh, excluded the systemic um, findings that are associated with the. Um, yes, sir. No other systemic uh, in this. Only there is some dimple in the nose. Yes, see, he, the child has no other systemic, like any cardiac bony defect or any renal defect. This That's was a very, very well managed case, and um, switch flaps are uh, not as popular today as they used to be. And um, many a times, when you take a large switch flap, you require. Uh, more than just a canthotomy and cantholysis, especially if the defect is larger, you may require a, the classical mustard cheek rotation flap. And the, you, you had a very nice uh, result with regard to the superior sympathon as well, because some of them um, have such an extensive growth of skin on the cornea, growing up to almost half or more, and then you get a relatively poor visual result. I'll hand over to Mukesh. I am fine. Mukesh, please go on. Dr. Mukesh? Dr. Mukesh? Dr. Mukesh, please speak now. Silent Mukesh. Mukesh, unmute, please. Mukesh, unmute. If you need to unmute. Yes. <laughs> Can you speak? Say hi to us. 
Dr. Mukesh? Okay, I was talking about the grafts that you need in the superior phonics. This, if you use mucous membranes, sometimes they tend to be hypertrophic and grow back. So many a times you need to operate them uh, multiple times if you really have a large skin growth extending onto cornea. So we were fortunate here to have not too much of a simbleferon in kind of involvement with a skin flap coming onto the cornea. Excellent result. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. Waiting for you. So uh, my compliment to Joyeta for managing this case really well. Only one or two points which I want to make here. One is that uh, these congenital colobomas, they have got some recoil. So whenever you are measuring the coloboma, you must hold both the ends of coloboma and bring them a little closer so that you do not really overdo it uh, whenever you are uh, making a flap. And secondly, uh, regarding the study switch flap, I think it should not be exactly the size match flap, it should be a little smaller than the coloboma. So whenever you are fashioning a mustardi switch flap, ideally it should not be more than 60 to 70 percent of the coloboma which is there. I have, yes sir, I have deducted 25 uh, percent of the defect from the yeah, you, 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 but mentioned that you have taken the same size. Uh, no, no, I have not mentioned, I have just sent to yeah. replicate yeah. it. Yeah. So and uh, again, you you uh, intervened at the right moment because uh, had you been delayed this particular case, uh, this particular patient uh, uh, really would have had the visual problems because cornea was getting bad. So again, uh, my compliment for managing this case. Thank you, sir. These are difficult cases. Thank you, sir. And many times, can I add something, Feroz? You. Yeah, many a times uh, I have experience of two cases. The advantage of the switch flap is that you have the eyelashes retained, number one. And number, ten, uh, number two, we need to do a multiple Z plus T. So if you require a little bigger size, then if you have in additionally do a Z plus T, it gives a better transposition. Yeah. If you are muted. Dr. Santosh, do we have any questions from the audience? One question from Akshay Nair. He asked if we do bilateral cutler beard, would the possibility of amblyopia still be there? Uh, the critical period is up to nine years. When we talk about amblyopia, we don't want to have a bilateral deprivation, visual deprivation up to nine years. The child appears to be smaller than nine years, so it is better to avoid cutler beard. And the switch flap, the visual movement of the eye here must be having some vision in either the very lateral or a very medial gaze. Dr. Mukesh, do you want to take that question as well? Yeah, actually what I think Dr. Akshay meant was that unilateral uh, deprivation will create more amblyopia. It is more amblyogenic than the bilateral deprivation. But still, bilateral deprivation itself will create amblyopia. So not as strong as the unilateral deprivation. But bilateral cutler beard will also definitely produce amblyopia, at least in such a young age. So no, ideally, it should be avoided. Why should be going for switch flap? Or I think this particular case, or maybe little lesser than this, may uh, can be uh, managed by McGregor's uh, Z plus T also. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Savdi, you have any? No, I just, uh, we had a similar case and, uh, you know, in, with uh, co-consultation with the pediatric ophthalmologist, we went ahead and planned it. We actually did a bilateral cutler beard uh, because the patient came from very far and was not possible to do multiple visits. So we actually released it much earlier than six weeks, which was literally by the count on the 24th or 25th day with sort of just a lot of prayer and it healed well. So 21 days was a cutoff, three weeks. In children, I've also seen that it heals very fast in three yes. weeks is the time when you can release in children. Three weeks. Also, yes. bilateral, bilateral occlusion in such young children is very much amenable to reversal as far as amblyopia is concerned. So that doesn't really become a big concern. Actually true. I, I too agree with that because we, we've done a couple of cases where We've done a bilateral coloboma, so we've done cutler beards, and it has done extremely well. Perfect. So we go on to the next talk today, uh, and uh, 
I uh, request Dr. Amit uh, to introduce our next speaker. We have Dr. Sajjad from the heaven on earth. Over to you, Dr. Amit. Yeah, thank you, Feroz. Uh, back uh, to uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Sajjad Fazili, a very good friend of mine. We have been associated with IRSI and a lot of conferences. Dr. Fazali is basically the director for Fazali Eye Care Center and he's practicing in Srinagar, Kashmir, in India. He's a cataract refractive and anaproplasty surgeon. And he was a pioneer in paper refractive surgery to start paper refractive in JNK, that is Jammu and Kashmir in India. He is presently the president of Kashmir Ophthalmological Society and is a recipient of the IRSI gold medal. So it's my privilege to introduce my friend, Dr. Sajad. So over to you, Dr. Sajad. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Amit. And over to you, Dr. Sajad. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would uh, not be starting before complimenting the most dynamic AIOS we've ever had. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Feroz, for having me. I am going to share you, share with you this case, uh, which is a case of belephrophimosis and uh, how uh, all the efforts uh, were scarred. So we have a 15-year-old female with ptosis and epicanthus inversus syndrome and uh, a previous history of surgery at around five years of age elsewhere. And we can see uh, uh, that she's around 7.5 diopters of myopia. And we can see that there's an earlier scar there, a little bit of hypertrophy. But this, this surgery has taken place at five years of age. And after that, most probably the patient got a little dissatisfied with the results or had not been properly counseled. So we did a detailed counseling and uh, uh, planned a YV-plasty, a medial canthoplasty with or without uh, shortening or um, plication of the MPL followed by a ptosis surgery. We talked to the uh, parents, but the parents seemed to be reluctant because they didn't want multiple surgeries. And uh, finally, the patient did not turn up. Uh, we saw the patient again eight years later, and uh, she was 23 years of age. Uh, this is 2007. And uh, patients now were desperate about treatment, uh, and patient was very, very enthusiastic. And uh, uh, myopia was stable at around uh, 11 diopters. She was using contact lenses. And she had literally finished her studies. Now she was into another stage where they were desperately looking for treatment. So uh, they refused treatment under general anesthesia. So they were explained that there are going to be multiple surgeries here. So uh, we did a uh, viviplasty, a medial canthoplasty on both sides uh, in two sittings. But as soon as we saw that, and, uh, we finished that part in March, we could see that there was some amount of uh, hypertrophy of the scar because a big uh, a plasty was done there, medial canthoplasty was done there. And we started massaging the scar and the scar uh, started going down. In May, we did a super maximum LPS section in the right eye. And you could see the scar in the, uh, on the left side has gone worse. The massage was continued. And in June, we did a maximum uh, LPS section in the left eye. And uh, I would want to point out here that this patient found out a very innovative way of uh, keeping the inverse frost suture. She pulls the pin up uh, uh, rather than tape it on the forehead. She pulls, the, she ties this inverse frost suture on the, um, because she got a lot of experience by now. So in June, uh, we seem to be having a reasonably good dosis correction and the scar is better on the right side, but it's worse on the left side. And the patient is suddenly starting getting very dissatisfied with the results. There is there's still some persistent edema on the left upper lid, and the lid crease is not uh, exactly perfect. But this is not what is giving us the trouble. The trouble is the hypertrophy of the scar. So uh, because we are in the process of fixing things, most probably we, we let this scar uh, get uh, unattended because there were bigger things happening. So the massaging continued. And after that, we realized in July that we, we cannot go uh, let this go. And we did an intralesional steroid injection. 20 milligrams were injected directly into the fibrinous 
portion of the scar repeated uh, twice, three weekly. Patient was very irritated by this time by the number of follow-ups, uh, also related to her refusing uh, 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 surgery under genesthesia, where we would have cut down the surgery to two uh, sittings. Anyway, a patient was uh, definitely getting better, but there was a persistent scar. So uh, the, you can see the lid edema on the left side is now less. The lid crease is better. There's a hypertrophy of, of the scar is also less. But uh, because uh, all oculoplastic surgery is basically, especially on the, uh, is, is, is cosmetic. So patient is still very dissatisfied considering the age at which we are handling this case. So uh, we went ahead and uh, corrected her 11 diopters of, um, 11 adapters of myopia, hoping for the LASIK wow effect, and that definitely happened. But uh, in small uh, cities where people are very closely connected, there's uh, one day two parents coming, another day uh, one parent, another day the uncle, auntie, everybody is turning up and telling us, doctor, everything is fine. The, uh, the post LASIK correction is fine. Uh, so I go ahead and uh, give an intralesional steroid again. And you can see that there's some amount of atrophy and there's a fatty layer developing there. So patient understands that she's getting better, but there's a butt attached to it. And all the relatives, uh, for two reasons, one is the amount of money they pay for uh, repeated uh, surgeries, the LASIK, and the number of visits they had to do and the follow-up. And... Uh, at the end of it, uh, she definitely thanked me, but there was a lot of stress in those nine months area. And that nine month effort, which seemed to be reasonably good, uh, uh, but for the scar was quite a strenuous one. So uh, what we're talking about is the possibility of a small scar or hypertrophic scar because it's on the face, uh, uh, giving a bad taste to a otherwise good effort. So could it be avoided? And what sutures are generally good for this to avoid it? What are the management options and what I should have done differently? And the counseling part. I'm sure I counseled the patient very well, but even then uh, uh, there are many uh, problems which are associated with a case like this. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Excellent presentation, Dr. Fasili. It's it's a very good, you know, uh, whatever. At the end, it has come out so beautiful. And I'm sure Dr. Ashok and uh, Grover and Dr. Savari is the right people to uh, discuss this uh, particular case. Uh, so may I request Dr. Grover uh, uh, to take over the discussion of this particular case? Thank you. Case. And we, <laughs> we have to remember it was done in 2007. We know that the uh, medial canthal region is particularly prone to scars. And we also know that we as pigmented people are more prone to scars. And somehow these blepharophimosis cases do tend to have a lot of scars in the medial region. We had the CU incisions earlier or the mustardis double Z plus T or the YV. The problem of scar is the <coughs> most important uh, inhibitory factor in your cosmesis, your transnasal wirings or MPL tuckings can take care of the telecanthus, the epicanthus very well. Lateral canthus you may or may not open because that takes away the beauty of the angle. It depends on the size of the horizontal palpable fissure. And uh, usually fascia lata sling, but uh, there are many advocates of um, a large levator resection as well. Although the levator action is poor in these cases, but it does work, in, and there are many advocates for that. One stage of stage procedures are other dilemmas, and management of scars is what um, Dr. Fazli is talking about. I think we now have the option of 5FU, which works quite well, and uh, particularly during the first three months and even later. But um, at that time, I think Tramsinolone was the best when he was dealing with this case in 2007. And um, except for the hypopigmentation issues and um, some other changes that uh, steroids left behind, those depots that it left behind, used to work moderately well. But now, of course, 5FU is the better option for dealing with these. And uh, of the various incisions, I prefer the YV most now because that, to me, gives the best scar. Over to Savri.
Sabri, unmute yourself. Uh, that was a. Uh, I think Dr. Grover has covered most of it. Dr. Fazili, that was an excellent presentation, very well documented. Uh, most of us uh, have this same uh, situation where a medial canthoplasty is left with, uh, you know, dealing with scars. So uh, I think the couple of questions that you said, sutures, I mean, most of us use either, you know, 6O proline, uh, which, you know, either which way you're going to have a scar. So I don't think it's suturing so much as the surgical technique, whether it's, you know, CU, IV or mustard is flying man. Um, but I think what uh, Dr. Gover said is very right. We do have the option of 5FU, which works extremely well. I found that even after three months, uh, all the way my oldest uh, scar, which I've injected is almost a year and a half after surgery. Uh, it still works well in a combination with triamcinolone, which is 50% triamcinolone, 50% 5FU. The main thing that you need to counsel the patient is that it's 5FU is an off-label use for, so there's a lot of uh, literature which you can present to the patient. Uh, and uh, there is no pigmentation which occurs, which is the beauty of 5FU. And I think regarding counseling, you like you said, you've probably done a great job of it. Um, usually I just tell the patient on the first visit, uh, if you're going to do a canthoplasty and a ptosis in the first sitting, that this over time, as you grow older, is possible that you may require uh, either modified invasive or non-invasive touch-up surgeries uh, because this is something as the child or the adult ear grows and the face structure changes, uh, you know, is going to change over time. So that's something that we kind of drive home the point. Which yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree that the suture might not be the most important thing here, but perhaps more important would be the tension which exists between the uh, at the incision at the at the surgery site. Because what uh, the, the wound derives its strength from collagen. And as the collagen is coming in, and uh, it's trying, the more the stress on the, uh, the, the incision site, the more you have removed. If the plication of the medial palpebral ligament is not good enough, that means you have not brought in, you have not uh, reduced the stress. So a lot of stress means along the tension lines, there are going to be deposition of a lot of collagen. And that collagen, uh, definitely early on, uh, it has been shown with pressure, it goes away with massaging uh, very early on, yes. with massaging using emollients um, and any antibiotic uh, or any other ointment. You can, you can keep on pressing it with uh, a lot of pressure and it actually works. And if it doesn't actually work, then we know that 5 fluorouracil is a very good option. But I guess uh, if you were to counsel the patient over a period of time, tell them what can uh, you, after all this, you might have a hypertrophic scar. It, it, it perhaps it might be very difficult for the uh, rest of the things can be explained. And uh, but most probably a hypertrophic scar. I, that's why I chose this, because uh, this is something, generally speaking, we'll not be talking in the counseling session. Thank you, Dr. Fazili. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think it's usually not the surgical technique which determines it. it, it I mean, you may do the best uh, what if, whatsoever. It's the biological reaction of the tissues, which is variable in people. A previous surgery done also would be a factor which would cause more scar. Yeah. If you've done a good transnasal wiring or tucking, usually you would have no tension on the wounds. You would, in fact, uh, have redundant flaps which you often need to trim. So uh, that right. may not be a factor, but uh, a good um, tucking or a good transnasal wiring would take care that there would be no tension on the wound. Second and thing, over okay. time, it does tend to reduce. The scar does become less over a period of year or more. And there are se several other techniques which uh, we all use, silicone ointments. Silicone uh, sheets are very difficult to apply on the small area on the medial side, but ointments with silicone and there are various other methods which are used uh, these days to reduce the scar. They can all be later used if for those where the scars persist. I think Dr. Grover raised a very good point. Sorry, sorry, that sometimes it's best to leave it alone after a point. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kikawa, can we hear from you how you manage such hypertrophic scars? I'm sure you see it. in patients. Yes, we do. And I think um, maybe one tool that we don't think about uh, very often is the fractional ablative laser and pulse dye. And um, so we involve our dermatology colleagues if, if necessary. I don't do the laser treatment myself, but that has been shown 
to reduce scarring. And in fact, uh, one of our uh, colleagues, Dr. Bradford Lee, wrote a paper co about combining 5-FU and fractional ablative laser in hypertrophic scarring. So I think in severe cases that, that can be helpful. Uh, but I agree with the, the way the case was managed at that time, and I think the result was good. Dr. Can I Mugler? add one thing? Yeah. Yes. Actually, uh, I agree with most of the things which have been said. Only point which I wish to add here is because we tend to see, we keep on seeing a lot of these cases. Two points which are important. One is there should not be any tension on the skin uh, wound or incision while you are suturing as it was stressed by, um, I think, uh, you also, Dr. Fajad also. The other point which is generally not uh, being taken care of is the redundancy of internal tissue. I feel this is the point which is creating more of scar now. We forget to uh, remove the orbicularis part as much as it should be removed in accordance to the skin. So now at what I do is precisely I measure and I remove the internal tissue 70% of the skin part. And that redundancy once like it's been taken care of, that also I think gives a very good uh, post-operative appearance. So redundancy of internal orbicularis also needs to be removed along with no tension on the skin wound. So I think these two points are... Uh, on a lighter note, i just like to add something, if it's okay, uh, Fairoz. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Yeah, no, because he was talking about, is there something wrong with the suture? Is there anything wrong with the procedure? I think he's done an excellent job in the other eye, and that could have been used for as a selling point for counseling. No, you know what I did? Every time the patients, parents, the patient, or, or the uh, relatives would come up, I would take off the first picture and show them again. And I would tell them, do you remember what glasses she wears? LASIK was a big, big help. Okay. All right. <laughs> Dr. Santosh, do we have any questions from no the questions. audience? No questions. All right, so uh, shall we go to the next case? Uh, it's yet another very interesting case. May I request Dr. Amit uh, to introduce our next speaker? I'm going to share the screen now. Sorry. Over to you, Dr. Amit. Yeah, thank you, Ferris. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ankita Aishwarya. She is a current fellow in ocular oncology and oculoplasty at Center for Sight Hyderabad, I think, under Dr. Santosh Varnavar itself. She has been awarded with the best outgoing student and a gold medalist in 2019. She's the recipient of Dr. Ramesh Krishna Agarwal Memorial Award for best poster in 2018. Regarding her ophthalmic knowledge, she has been the best. And that has been proven by she's being a winner of national of national quiz, not once or twice, but thrice. That is in 2017, 18, and 19. So over to you, Dr. Ankita. Uh, pleasure to be a, uh, have you as a part of this webinar. Thank, Thank you so much. Sir. Sharing my screen. Yes. Okay, uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, it is. Go ahead. Okay, fine, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting on congenital ichthyosis, less is more. No financial disclosure. Eight month old child who was a product of consanguineous marriage, a known case of congenital ichthyosis, was referred for nocturnal lag of thalamus and surgical correction of ectropion. Child was already on treatment with lubricants. On ocular examination, there was thick fissured plaques, madarosis, absent lid crease, dry and scaly lids, bilateral upper and lower lid psychiatrical ectropion, broad nasal bridge, matted eyelash, punctal eversion, and a clear cornea. On systemic examination, there was hyperkeratotic bands leading to joint contracture, along with dystrophic nails and seboric dermatitis. Further examination revealed scarring alopecia, eclabium, and diffuse thick desquamating plaques over the entire surface of the body. So based on history and clinical manifestation, a diagnosis of lamellar ichthyosis was made. Ichthyosis are a heterogeneous group of disorders which are characterized by abnormal hyperkeratinization, hyper subsequent scaling, 
loss of normal skin integrity there are four different types ichthyosis vulgaris x linked ichthyosis lamellar ichthyosis and bullous ichthyosis the lamellar and the bullous ichthyosis although are rare are present at birth the bullous ichthyosis they have intense blistering at birth whereas lamellar ichthyosis they have a collodion baby and a ectropion the other two conditions although are common but they present in early childhood other ocular manifestations are psychotracial entropion trichiasis exposure keratopathy lag of thalamus and the following the main enzyme responsible for lamellar ichthyosis is transglutaminase 1 now this enzyme helps in maintenance of epidermal lipid barrier and cohesiveness of the stratum corneum whenever there is a mutation it can lead to hyperkeratosis leading to joint contracture anterior lamellar contraction leading to ectropion increase in the transepidermal water loss leading to dryness and loss of barrier function leading to skin infection there are two different schools of thought for the management the medical and the surgical but whatever schools of thought we take the primary aim of the treatment is to prevent the secondary bacterial infection to prevent the corneal scarring to correct the ectropion and to eliminate the scaly the surgical modalities can be divided into two parts the temporary and the permanent the temporary measures are relaxing incision with suture tarsography inverting sutures and the fillers the permanent methods are skin graft mucous membrane graft and cheek transposition flap but the complications associated with them are they can lead to contraction of the graft recurrence and hyperpigmentation there are three principles for the medical management hydration lubrication and keratolysis the hydration and the lubrication are taken care by the moisturizing agents the lubrication and the keratolysis are taken care by the topical retinoids and the keratolysis per se is taken care by the systemic retinoids now the systemic retinoids they facilitate the shedding of the scales so what happens that the anterior lamellar contraction is re is released and helps decrease this is the tendency for the ectropion to progress secondly it also prevent the excessive hyperkeratosis and also helps in collagen synthesis this help in maintaining the normal elasticity of the skin so our plan of management was conservative treatment followed by close observation and then surgical intervention if needed the treatment protocol which we followed included all the three elements our first step was to hydrate the skin by using optimized hydration and lubrication we mix the petroleum jelly and the moisturizer so that there is no ev minimal evaporation the ratio was based on the thickness of the scales this was followed by cocoonization of the baby the child was also started on oral retinoids acetretin at a dose of 10 mg once daily along with topical retinoic acid pretinoin 0.05% and copious lubrication 6 weeks later our child was recovering well and doing better in terms of skin texture and ectropion movement of the joint and scarring alopecia the side effects associated with the systemic retinoids are mucocutaneous disorders teratogenicity developmental delay abnormal lipid profile and osteoporosis at 2.2 and 1/2 years of follow up our child has developed no systemic complication and both physical and mental developmental milestones are normal there is complete resolution of ectropion no punctal eversion lid crease has formed the skin texture and the quality is better there is near resolution of scarring alopecia and the child has near normal appearance on follow up few things has to be kept in mind number 1 the liver function test and the lipid profile test should be done before the treatment and at 1 month and 3 months following the treatment the growth of the growth and the bone development should always be monitored the children should be advised and the parents should be told that to avoid any strenuous activity in the high temperature and if there is a fertile woman then contraceptive should be maintained so to conclude the monitored medical management with understanding of the disease process can result in significant and sustained improvement with the correction of ectropion without the need of surgery and to avoid any surgical complication treatment should be individually optimized 
This is another patient who was on a long term follow up. This child presented to us as a tarsal ectropion and exposure keratopathy. We couldn't get her pictures, but uh, with the suture tarsography, and currently she is on a six after 16 years of follow up, she is uh, attending her school and doing very well. That's all from my side. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ankita. Very well managed case, uh, you know. So uh, definitely less is more. So may I uh, invite our esteemed panelists, Dr. Usha Kim and uh, Dr. Santosh Unava. So over to you, Dr. Usha. Uh, uh. I think it's an excellent outcome and both the cases showed an excellent outcome. Can't ask for better. And I think we'll have to firmly believe that less is more in this particular scenario. And uh, I think she's taken us through all the options available. The only thing, uh, one word of caution, probably they would have looked through all of those, is uh, typically you will have all other abnormalities also. And we'll have to bear in mind the other associated uh, uh, abnormalities, especially in, if it is a syndromic case, you probably have to look at the neurological condition, the skeletal uh, deformities, if at all present. But it's usually the skin and the hair that's uh, probably affected most. That's one part. And the other thing is, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, they've mentioned all about the management aspect. Probably the one thing that they're recommending now is vitamin D. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's one thing. And in very, very, very bad advanced cases, they also talk about ammonium lactate, mm -hmm. uh, which is what the dermatologists also suggest. So I think uh, with whatever the outcomes are, which are shown, I think it's done phenomenally well. And uh, I think, uh, thank God, Ankita didn't win the 2020 quiz. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Santosh, so yeah, we, we are discussing about less is more. I'm sure you have a lot of experience on uh, skin graft in these uh, uh, babies as well. Can you just uh, yeah. highlight your experience? It's a very rare condition. Incidence is 1 in 300,000 live births. So it's very rare. We do have experience with skin grafting that was a very uh, early case, I suppose, was managed about 10 12 years ago and Seema reported it she wrote it up in OPRS journal where uh, there was refractory ectropion which was not responding to conventional medical treatment as we did here scarring was very extensive that was managed with maternal skin graft now of course if you do HLA matching etc there cannot be ever a perfect match between the child's skin and the mother's skin but what we harvest from the mother is the dermis that helps in kind of extending the anterior lamina that can be easily done with mucous membrane graft as well, which will epidermalize. So basically either by using a maternal skin graft or by using a preserved dermis such as alloderm, you have to extend the anterior lamina and support that, that until epidermalization takes place. That is a surgical approach. Short of it, of course, there is tarsorophy. All right. Dr. Don, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, hi. Um, Can we hear I, I, from you? Yeah. Yes, I do have experience with skin grafting before the successful medical treatment. And, and I agree. I think this is a, um, a very groundbreaking treatment for this. And, and I, I think with the results possible medically, I don't think we have to operate on these patients anymore. All right. Yeah. Dr. Usha, is there anything like a message from uh, these, you know, rare cases that you actually want to highlight to the viewers? I think the less is better, definitely. I think if there is a chance that we, we can manage it medically, I don't think we should intervene. And these are young babies and these uh, don't deserve the surgical treatments that we sometimes advocate or uh, pursue. I think right now we have evidence and I think we should stop trying out any surgical measures unless it's absolutely necessary. Because it's often uh, conjunctiva is not compromised. Very rarely the cornea is compromised. Uh, when it is exposed. So I think we have enough lubricants uh, and enough uh, ways to keep the surface moist. So I don't think we should advocate any surgery at this point. Okay. Do we have any... Systemic yeah. retinoids prolong life as well because they have these children have an issue with thermoregulation, especially when they are uh, young. They have heat regulation mechanism which is impaired because of lack of sweating. And retinoids by remodulating stratum corneum increases sweating and actually thermoregulates them. So the chance of them having electrolyte imbalance and having sudden death is much less if you start using uh, retinoids. 
So even if you have to do surgery in a given refractive situation, systemic treatment is still important for life. Got it. Do we have any comments from the panelists? This is the last case, and uh, we would definitely want to hear from anyone. Dr. Grover, Dr. Savri is here, uh, Preeti is here, Dr. Kasturi is here. That I would like to say is that it has been organized beautifully, and we've had some fantastic cases, very well presented, and have thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. Very well structured, and thanks to Firuz, and thanks to All India Ophthalmic Society. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Parsa. Thank you, our guests. Uh, to the scientific um, for this program and uh, contributed so much to it. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, everybody else. Yeah. Okay. May I request all the speakers to come on the screen if you're around? I'm on the stage, you mean? <laughs> I'll come onto the stage. Yes, yeah. so we're coming to the end of the talk. So it's uh, it's really extremely extremely thankful. I extend my gratitude. To all the international speakers, Dr. Don, Dr. Cat, and uh, our esteemed national, uh, you know, stalwarts in oculoplasty who made it a great, uh, uh, you know, webinar for us, and all the presenters who came up with very, uh, you know, interesting case files and X files, uh, which I'm sure made it very interesting. I hope the viewers and the audience also uh, enjoyed this webinar. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you so very much. And Dr. Dawn, especially you, I made him get up early morning at 5.30 a.m. in San Diego. And there he on, is. On today. a Sunday morning. I, I want to just say thank you. It's just been fantastic yeah. to interact with all of you. And and um, I learned a lot. And, and congratulations on a wonderful seminar. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So Dr. Ramsey is here. Dr. Ramsey is also Dr. Kikawa's uh, uh, um, fellow. And uh, that's how I know both of them. Ramsey, thank you so much. Dr. Raul is here. Dr. David is here. Thank you very much, uh, Fairuz. It was an excellent meeting. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, see you in Manila next year. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Dr. Kat, are you here? Dr. Shubra, thank you very much for, you know, uh, getting me in touch with Dr. Kat. And it was a wonderful talk. It was something very, very different that I have personally never thought about. So I think it has really brought in so many thoughts and ideas in us regarding feminization and, uh, you know, surgery. Thank you very much, all of you. If anyone want to say something, we have a platform right here before we go off. May uh, I say something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, this was one of the most interesting webinars that I've listened to as a viewer. And what I thought to myself, if I had a choice of this webinar before my post-graduation, before my fellowship, I possibly would have been an oculoplasty surgeon. Great. You say that you did retina fellowship and you do cornea and cataract and refractive surgery. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Dr. Partha, so kind of you and so great of you to spend so much time. I think I think we're having a feast. We're having a feast every day. And this has been a fantastic lockdown. And 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 and, and it has been amazing. I have uh, in my lifetime not seen a better um, better and dynamic AIOS. Thank you very much. Dr. Fazli, we are missing a Kashmiri feast. Those <laughs> things are fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Waiting for one. <laughs> It'll come through Dr. Partha. <laughs> <laughs> Rest, I think, has to wait. <laughs> so but my my team is Dr. Amit is here. Dr. Somshila is there. So we have a fabulous team again who backed me up uh, so much uh, to conduct this. Thank you all. So, uh, can we say a good night and a goodbye? Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Good night. Thank you.